Okay, so welcome. Uh, we're going to continue where we left off last time, uh, which is we were looking at recursions for Markov reward processes, and we just discussed uh, what the recursion would be for a Markov decision process. So let me. Uh, so what I'm going to do is again recap a couple of things from last lecture, uh, give you uh, again an overview of uh, uh, where we are going with today's lecture, which is about deep reinforcement learning. Uh, but at the same time, also connected back to uh, things that we saw in the previous couple of lectures. Okay, so so before I do that, let me give you a uh, quick uh, couple of examples. I think uh, which. Uh, which may motivate you to see like, you know, what's the end goal of reinforcement learning, right? No, not the end goal, but what are some cool applications of RL that have come out? Uh, and so these are uh, just, uh, you know, a couple of examples. So here you can see, I don't know how many of you recognize this game. Um, it's called Doom. So you can see that the agent playing this game is actually an RL agent, which, you know, trained over several, several uh, episodes or several runs. Uh, to be able to shoot uh, the enemies and, and so on, right? So, uh, and, and some of you might have also played this game. Um, right, uh, so this game, again, you have a, so, so folks are able to train uh, uh, the agent in this case, uh, you know, basically the agent is typically, typically human, but here the computer is gonna, uh, be able to do the moves like uh, you know jump and not jump and so on, uh, so as to maximize the score that is being displayed on the screen, right? So cumulative score uh, it needs to be maximized, and your actions have longer term consequences. For example, if you took a jump action very far away from the two pipes, then you may have you may be in a bad state, future state, uh, where the state is just think of it as every you know every second every screen displays a new state. Um, so you may be in a bad situation in the future, okay? And so maybe you'll get bad rewards or you, you know, you, your game may end and so you collect low rewards because of an action that you took several uh, time steps before. Um, same thing, this is a little bit of an older video. Uh, so I don't know how, if you guys can see. Uh, so there's a video of a self-driving car uh, from three years ago. Uh, so this, you know, the underlying technology, of course, there are many, many different components to, uh, uh, affect, you know, to such, you know, to get to such a state. Uh, but one of the components uh, you can think of as uh, being reinforcement learning. There's a heavy use of supervised learning as well. So all the stuff that you saw with images, um, uh, image segmentation, or localization, and object detection and stuff like that. We have not seen those tasks yet. Uh, some of the tasks that we saw were mostly, uh, the tasks that we saw were mostly centered around classification, but uh, this is one uh, outcome of both RL and uh, supervised learning. And, and here's a quick uh, uh, demo, which uh, will motivate, uh, I guess, uh, you know, I was showing Atari game screens last time. So this is one example Atari game. Uh, this is called, I guess, this is Breakout. And so here you can see how, a, uh, how an agent uh, trained by uh, the company DeepMind uh, was able to learn over different uh, multiple rounds. So, so this is at the beginning when the agent is just learning how to move the paddle at the bottom. So you move the paddle, ensure that the uh, ball doesn't fall down and, and the ball hits the top bricks, and hopefully clear as many bricks as possible in, in a game, okay? So, um, so here the agent is pretty much uh, trying to learn that. Uh, so after a lot of, lot of number of training episodes, uh, you can see uh, the agent uh, is, is has figured out some strategy. Okay, strategy essentially here is actions, and the actions are move the paddle left, move the paddle right, right. Uh, so here the agent has figured out that if if it bounces uh, the the ball this way, then the ball is going to clear a lot of bricks. Okay, so this is something uh, even humans may may figure out after playing this game for for some amount of time. Okay, so so with that motivation, let me uh, come back to. Let me come back to where we were, and uh, and maybe I'll I'll make a quick detour on uh, the the bigger picture. Okay, so for for at least the next uh, couple of minutes. 
if you have any questions, do do not hesitate uh, to ask. So um, let me start with online machine learning, right? So we were doing this. Uh, by the way, uh, the assignment four is out. Uh, um, it deals with both the bandit and contextual bandit settings as well as a simple, a simple enough RL, um, you know, evaluating an existing algorithm. And in fact, we'll see that algorithm today. So hopefully that will help uh, quite a bit. So in online machine learning, uh, this is two lectures ago when we were looking at online machine learning, we said there's a for loop, right? Uh, for loop basically means uh, you know, for some, some index, let's say some discrete time, t is equal to one, to some maybe capital number of capital T number of rounds. Uh, you so you as in you as the learner agent or the computer, okay, it's all the same thing. So uh, agent uh, sees context. Right? The context uh, let's you know since we're doing RL, let's call it the context is ST. Okay. Agent sees context. Um, agent plays or, or takes a decision, plays an action, uh, AT. Okay, so by the way, uh, this doesn't have to be lowercase. I mean, I'm, I'm just using lowercase, uppercase uh, informally here and we'll in any way use it informally. But when you want to analyze algorithms, you want to appropriately choose capital letters for random variables and, and, and you know, differentiate random variables from uh, fixed uh, objects. Okay, anyway, agent plays AT when it sees the context ST and then environment, uh, response with a reward. Uh, I'm going to use R T plus one. Okay. And it also responds with what's going to happen next, you know, um, ST plus one. So this uh, was characteristic in reinforcement learning. This was not there uh, for contextual bandits. Okay. And this was not there for bandits at all. Okay. This was not there for bandits. And this was not there for contextual bandits. Okay. Uh, so environment responds with this, and, and this is the same thing uh, that's going to be seen by the agent in the next round. Okay, so so this was the for loop. Okay, and so two lectures ago we were talking about okay, so we anyway have to make decisions. Let's focus on decisions. These may be richer objects than uh, class labels, and you know, so subscript T is just you know. So let's say these all decisions have to be taken in the set capital A. So for example, this, these decisions could be as simple as by no buy or hold or sell, whatever it is. Let's say you're in a, a stock market portfolio optimization problem, <laughs> or it could be inventory management problem, right? Uh, or it could be display website A versus display website B. So the focus is, initially we started focusing on decisions and then we just said, okay, there's some way to do decisions in a, in a, in a proper way, which is to do A-B testing. Then we said, okay, every testing may be wasteful in terms of uh, sample efficiency, in the sense that if we know, you know, we learn early on that uh, B is, you know, option B or website B or you know our second decision, let's say it's no buy, uh, is 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 not doing well, then you want to expose, you dynamically want to update what the next arriving uh, user, for example, sees. Okay, you want to dynamically just shift all your focus on showing them website A, which seems to be faring better. But at the same time, you want to explore, okay? And so that uh, uh, idea was captured in multi-on bandits that you want to uh, think of like uh, interacting with environment. In this case, there's no context, but you're interacting with environment, you're taking decisions, but you want to take those decisions which are more promising, but at the same time, you want to explore enough so that you know which decision is actually promising, okay? So that was, for example, we saw uh, Epsilon Grady, and, and various other algorithms, okay. And, and then we moved from multi on bandits to contextual bandits, right? In contextual bandits, there's, there's a context. And so you want to actually find now functions, okay? Which map from context to actions, okay? So, so up till this point, there were only actions. Uh, there was no context. And, and from contextual bandit onwards, we have a uh, context as well. So I'm just writing ST as a context because just to keep it uh, aligned with what we're going to talk today and what we spoke about uh, last lecture. Okay, we want to find functions which map from uh, a context to an action. Okay, and this is also called a policy. Um, and, and so the objective was to uh, find these policies while ensuring that you again exploit 
information that you know so far. So with some some you know uh, some actions are better in some contexts. While uh, also exploring uh, once in a while, which is for example using epsilon greedy style approach, where for you know for the same context with some probability you will try out a random action, uh, or you will try out the action uh, that's based on the best policy so far. Okay, and here we actually did not explore many algorithms. We only saw X before, which essentially enumerates all functions, so it's not really scalable the moment you have too many functions. So for example, if you think of linear functions, there are many. Okay, there are too many. One linear function for every uh, uh, parameter vector, parameter vector beta, right? Uh, but if you had only ten functions to choose from, then uh, you know exp4 is a way to work in a contextual manner setting while still uh, taking care of exploration, and exploitation, and also uh, taking into account that there are contexts, you know, which was missing in the bandit setting. Okay, and then last time uh, we uh, jumped into RL and we we said how is it different from supervised learning? Okay. And also, we started looking at some components of RL. Uh, let me also tell you that RL uh, is related to also another problem, and we'll see this version today as well, uh, called planning. Okay. So you'll say, "Oh, what is planning?" You know. So planning is just uh, think of it as an optimization problem. So RL, because there's the L part here, so you have to learn. Okay. Uh, but if you know everything about your environment, okay. For example, uh, uh, if you know everything about how uh, the game of chess, you know how moves are made, and if I move, make a make a specific move or a decision, how the board changes, you know everything. But you still need to figure out what's the best action to take, right? Uh, so that problem is called planning, okay. And, and in particular, you can think of these two as uh, two parts of a sequential decision. Making okay, so just think of sequential decision making problems means either RL problems or planning problems, and 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 we, you know, MDP where you know the transition probabilities and the reward functions when you know them a priori, uh, then it's just an optimization problem to figure out the best policy. Okay, in a in a Markov decision process. Anyway, so that's how RL is related to you know related to this close enough problem called planning. Uh, but last time we saw we we spoke about this. How is it different? And and then we uh, spent a bit of time on on some of the basic components. So one of them was a policy, uh, which is a mapping from states to actions. Let's say if it's a deterministic policy, if it's a stochastic policy for every given state, it'll, it'll create a distribution of actions. Okay, it's a little bit more messier, a little bit more complex, but it's a policy. You know, it's just a mapping from uh, states to actions. At the end of the day, even if it's a stochastic policy, you would pick a sample from that distribution of actions and and play that action. Uh, you would have a policy. You also have what is called a, a value. Uh, so value for every state. Uh, okay. So it's just how good a state is. So it's a number. Um, so it's basically. So this is a number in you know on in the, in real in, on the real line, right? So it's a number that you get ascribed to every state. Let's say you only have ten states, or hundred states, and there's one number per state. Okay. And we saw that with the maze example. Uh, next, we also saw. Uh, I think there were several uh, versions of this notation, but basically, P S uh, S prime given action A and R S and A. So, so what are these two symbols? These are just the uh, you know they characterize the environment. Okay, so um, in the sense that we are also assuming uh, Markovian uh, environments where you are in the state S. You take an action A. There's some probability with which you'll go to state S prime. Okay, that's essentially captured by this symbol. This has a lot of uh, you know upper you know superscripts and subscripts. But basically, you're saying if you're in state S, it took an action. You know, if, if I so think of from the environment perspective, if I'm in state S and the agent tells me this is the action that I'm going to take, the environment changes state to S prime. Okay, with some probability. It could be also deterministic. Similarly, uh, R of S and A is just saying, oh, if I'm in state S uh, and the agent shows me, you know, tells me to do action A, essentially, or exposes me to action A, then I'll give them this reward, which is R. Okay, uh, this can be again uh, stochastic, or if it's stochastic, this this number you can think of as an expectation. Uh, this this express this expression here, uh, R could be a deterministic number, because these are the three components basically. Uh, the model. So this is actually called the model. Uh, this is just the value, value function, and uh, this is just the policy. Okay. 
So these are the three basics that we saw. And uh, last time, uh, then we started talking about MDPs or Markov decision process as a way to uh, express an environment more cleanly. Okay, so I mean, we already expressed this when we, when we wrote the model, we already talked about a, a conditional probability, this, this transition probability function as well as reward function. So those anyway, already are cleanly specifying what an environment will do when you show an action, to, uh, when, when you uh, do an action in that environment. But MDP is also a uh, formula is the same thing. It's essentially the same thing. So uh, so we, we started talking about MDPs and within MDPs, uh, Professor, I have a yeah. doubt. Uh, so uh, regarding the pi function, so which is mm -hmm. the policy here, is it like a function like saying uh, pi of s gives an action a, or is it like a distribution where, you know, uh, a distribution of actions given the state s? So how, how yes. is it understood? Yes, 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 yes. So, um... Okay, so I think uh, I'll just say that. So, so pi. So, so generally, okay, uh, this is a little bit. Uh, so, mathematicians, the way they refer to functions is they they'll say, oh, what is the input space, or the input space is some set S, uh, which is the set of states, to what is the output space, set of actions. Okay, so these are like think of S as like a state one all the way to state some ten, and actions is uh, a one to a three. Let's say there are three actions in this. So a, a policy is just a function. For every state, it'll say, oh, what's the action, right? So this is one example of a policy. It's called deterministic policy. Okay, so this is this, you can think of just as like a classifier. Okay, so given the input vector, so think of the states as vectors. Okay, this S1 as a vector one and S10 as 10th vector. Each for each vector, there's some output label. You can think of that. Right. Uh, then it's a, it's just a function that you're pretty much familiar with. Okay. You're, you know, in supervised learning, but you can also think of a policy as uh, going from a uh, state, right, uh, to a distribution of actions. So I think the way what's the notation here, but anyway, let me just call it. Uh, um, uh, okay, let me call it a distribution or actions. Okay. So here, this is called a stochastic policy. Here it's saying, oh, given the state S, uh, so, and you will also see this notation instead of writing it this way, uh, people write it as this way, pi of A given S, okay. So they're saying given state S, there's a distribution. So it's basically, uh, this is, think of it as a probability mass function. So uh, there are three actions, right? So given the state S, the probability of me, you know, this policy is suggesting that action A is, let's say 30%, action two is 40%, action three is uh, 30%, okay. This is one another representation. So, of course, the first version is a special case of the second version where the distribution is like, oh, just take action two and there's zero and zero for the other two, for example. Oh, so it's like more like a rule based, like we have this. Yeah, these are just all functions are rules, right? It's like given the input, is it, so think of a function as a, just that's the your Python function, def. Yeah. Okay. You know, pi takes an input and return some a, right? That's what a function is, right? It's just yeah. that in the stochastic version, It'll flip a like if it has to suggest an action uh, because it's made a, you know for every state it's first come, come giving a distribution of oh this is the action that you know take this action with thirty percent take that action with forty percent take another action with thirty percent okay. but at the end of the day you have to take one action so you have to anyway flip a coin and figure out which one and then then play that okay that's a yeah. stochastic policy okay but both are essentially you know take state you know some state vector context vector you know just think of it as feature vector essentially. Okay and produce a decision, okay? Take action one by yourself or take action two, you know, something else, right? Yeah, yep. but actions are again, you know, they're real, you know, they could be numbers, binary, you know, just like class labels, right? Uh, cat or dog, something like that. So you can just encode them as numbers and then appropriately interpret them. Oh, got it. So, uh, and in professor and in RL, how, how it would be like, so, suppose we are, you know, like playing a pong game. Yeah. So suppose we, we miss the ball and we just move left and we miss the ball. Yeah. So, you know, like how it would be like, will it go right in that case, you know, like the opposite of the action that we took? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a great question. Uh, I think uh, we're going to discuss pong uh, again, uh, not, not pong, uh, we saw breakout, right? So, but we're going to discuss, uh, at this this Atari context, for example, in a little bit more detail when we talk about deep in post learning. Mm -hmm. But uh, just to give you a, a quick idea, uh, so in, uh, so let's come back. To, let me just make a square here. So your question was, if if you took a wrong decision and the ball you know fell off, right? Yeah. Uh, then you basically lost. So the game ends. Okay, that's mm -hmm. like a, let's call it terminal state. So so in in RL, uh, 
So, so games are generally episodic. Mm -hmm. Just means uh, things happen in episodes. So, for example, you, let's say you fix a policy. Okay, there's some policy. Oh, if if the balls are this way, uh, I'll move the paddle left or you know up or down. You know, mm -hmm. in, in the pong game. Uh, let's say you fix a the policy. Then maybe uh, you see some state starting state of where the ball is. Maybe the opponent, you know, in in the Atari environment is just. Mm -hmm. I know the ball is coming certain way. That's state one. You took an action A one. Maybe you were able to defend the ball and the ball went back to the opponent. That's you know, let's say state two. And maybe at some point, maybe state ten, you took a wrong action. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and 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 so the ball just you know went out of the screen. So you you lost basically. So this here it's a, it's a terminated. Yeah. So you terminate here, but this is like a trace, you know, given the policy, this is the sequence of uh, state actions. Uh, and mm -hmm. of course, intermediately, you may get some rewards. I don't know if in Pong you get intermediate rewards. I, I think you do. Uh, so you may get some plus one, uh, plus one every time you, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, defend the ball, you'll be able to put the ball on the other side. So that would be the rewards, okay? So R, R2, whatever, R3 and so on. Yeah, so so it will you know like it will get the positive rewards for all the action, and only you know like we'll get a negative reward for the the action where ball was terminated. Yeah, yeah. So if you terminate, uh, you can say zero reward. Let's say uh, yeah, it doesn't have to be positive. It's a po yeah, it's all relative. So whether mm -hmm. it's positive reward or zero reward or negative reward, it's all relative. But uh, in the the objective is to figure out uh, this policy or these actions by trying out again and again. In a clever way, so that uh, you can maximize the total collected rewards in, in expectation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, um, okay. Yeah, thanks. So we'll we'll revisit this. Uh, you know, what are the actions and uh, what what are we doing again in the in the context of a you know an Atari game pretty soon. Okay. Mm -hmm. The second half of this lecture. So uh, let's come back here. Uh, so we we're talking about MDPs, and then uh, we said, okay, to understand MDPs, let's talk about Markov chains, which are the simplest is simplest object where all you're saying is, uh, and, and last time somebody asked a question about uh, hidden Markov models as well. So Markov chains are just think of as a bunch of random variables. Uh, it's just that it's called a Markov chain because uh, these random variables uh, take values in in a in a specific set of values. Okay, and those are let's say these ten states. For example, here I was talking about 10, 10 states, right? Uh, here, S one to S ten. These are the only values, let's say, the, the environment can take. Then Marco chain is just saying, oh, first random variable realization is state one. Okay, this is that, that first vector. The second Marco, second random variable realization is some one of these 10 values. And third, third one is some one of these 10 values. So Marco chain is basically characterized by a state transition uh, matrix, which says, oh, if you're in state three, what's the probability with which you'll go to state one all the way to state 10? So it's like a 10 cross 10 matrix, where given your state is state three, the next random variable, which value it can take. So this is again a distribution, right? Um, so once somebody tells you this transition probability matrix, uh, the first uh, you know random variable, let's say you're starting from state three, then the next state could be you know state nine with some probability, you know, because you have to flip coin, uh, you know, realize the randomness. Maybe it's state nine from state nine, maybe you go to the ninth row. There's some other distribution, uh, and then maybe you went to state seven, uh, and so on. So okay, this is the realization of a of a Markov chain. But the random variable here, you can just call it maybe x1, x2, x3. They took the specific values, which are these state values. Okay, uh, that's a Markov chain, and uh, you know a Markov reward process uh, was just the same thing as a Markov chain. But when when you are in a state, you also get a reward. Okay, so maybe r1, uh, let's call it r2 actually, just to be consistent. Uh, x2 uh, gives r3. X, uh, sorry, R4, and so on. So basically, you're just again doing the same thing, uh, realizing different different states. At, uh, at you know, we are, we are in fact actually sorry, we are talking about discrete time uh, Markov chains. Okay, finite state Markov chains. Uh, just to be just to ensure that things are you know uh, clear. Uh, so Markov reward processes just mean that you have an additional numbers being spit out every time the you realize the next random variable. Okay. So that's it. So you, you have a sequence of random variables. They're all realizing, you know, in a, in a single realization of uh, the Markov chain, you will realize the first random variable, second one, third, third one, fourth one, fifth one, and so on. Along with the realizations of those random variables, which, you know, the random variable is X, X itself, but the realization could be one of these 10 states. You also have additional numbers, which are rewards, okay? So that's a Markov reward process. Okay. And uh, Markov reward process itself had uh, this notion of a return random variable, Okay, GT, 
a return random variable, variable just means that, okay, if I'm looking at the teeth, you know, let's say uh, XT, let's say teeth are uh, uh, random variable, what is the cumulative sum of returns from that random variable onwards? Because you know the Markov chain keeps going on and on and on if unless it hits a state from which there is no other transition, okay, like a terminal state. Okay, there need not be a terminal state, so it could continue going on and on and on forever, but uh, it doesn't matter. So what I'm saying is from, from the teeth uh, random variable, what is the total sum of uh, rewards that I'm seeing? Okay, or discounted total sum of rewards. So for example, this could be equal to RT plus one plus gamma times RT plus two plus gamma squared times RT plus three and, and so on. Okay, uh, if, if there is a gamma, if there is a discount factor, if not, it's just a sum of the random variables from this, uh, the reward random variables from this point on. So that's the return. And for MR, for, for macro reward process, there's also this expectation of this, this guy, expectation with respect to uh, the, mark, the the transition probability matrix basically, right? This, this object here. Um, and expectation of GT is essentially called the value. Okay, so value of, so let's say that particular random variable at time T was, uh, uh, took the value, state value, you know, the random variable took a value a little less than the value of being in, in uh, you know, sorry, the value of uh, being in this, this particular state value is uh, the expectation of this written random variable, okay? So, so this is just an extra pro extra number that you can calculate once somebody tells you uh, Marco chain and and uh, this this reward, you know, so how is how, what is the what are the reward random variables? Okay, if they tell you, then you can compute this extra number, which is the value. Okay, and then uh, we wanted to now come back to uh, the MDP uh, version, which is just a Marco reward process with extra decisions. Okay, so now actions come into the picture. So from Marco chains to Marco reward process, rewards came into the picture. And then from Marco reward process, Marco decision process, actions came into the picture. So which means that these transitions are not just simple state to state transitions. They also depend on state action and then what's the next state. Okay, so this, so this, this matrix here will change. Okay, so it has to depend on not just the previous state. Uh, so when, let's say, for example, where you go to the next state, not just depends on the current state, but also the action that you take. Okay, so that's the quick recap of where we were. Um, any questions at this point? Uh, uh, so, Professor, uh, so we have uh, certain variables like agents, policies, and um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, agent is just that, software. Okay, just computer, yeah. just a program. Just think of it as that way. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, let's say uh, we have a situation where the environment is un un not explored. Like unlike chess or something. So yes, uh, yes. in such scenarios, how, how are these reward uh, uh, variables considered? Like, is it given as an input or is it learned over time uh, based on the situations that the mission gets to face? Yeah, yeah, that's a very, very good question. So in fact, uh, let's focus on this. Uh, uh, let's focus on this, right? So there's in reinforcement learning, there's the learning as a word there in that phrase. And there's also this uh, problem called planning. Okay, so you think of the chess problem as like a planning problem, where everything is known. Like every like given a board, a chess board, uh, does it, hopefully everybody knows what a chess game is, right? Yeah. Or does somebody not know what a chess game is? Okay, so everybody knows. Okay, so so given the board, the state of the board is like where are the pawns, where are the different uh, you know king, queen, rook, and so on. So where are those, uh, you know, uh, uh, pawns? And then uh, for you to, uh, so you, your decision, in, let's say you're one of the players, your decision is to figure out where, where to move the next, you know, the given your side of the pawns, uh, you know, where to move them, right? So that's your decision. So, so but everything is known about this game, right? So if I move like this, uh, uh, then of course, I don't know what the other player is going to do, but we know what they, they are constrained in the sense they, have, they all have to follow some deterministic rules. So every pawn, wherever it moves, we know exactly uh, what are the possibilities. Okay. There's nothing stochastic. I mean, there's a opponent of course, but uh, you making an action will, will be very clear what the next state would be, right? So if you take an action to move a pawn forward, then clearly the next board state is that there's the pawn is in the front, right? So there's no randomness there. Uh, so there's not, you don't, you're not trying to learn the rules of the game in the, let's say in the chess environment. You're just trying to figure out what the next decision is. Okay, uh, so we'll see a version of that. In fact, uh, later today uh, for the game of Go. Uh, but in reinforcement learning, since there's a learning component, you will not know, you would not have explored in every state 
every action. Okay, so there has to be some learning, just like uh, in the contextual bandit case or the multi-arm bandit case. Let's say you had, uh, uh, let's say, a second action or a third action. You never tried it, then you haven't learned anything about it. Okay, maybe that was the best action to take. Okay, so there has to be some exploration in in all these online machine learning problems. Okay, which is not so, so which is not a thing in you think about in supervised learning at all. Right? So. So in reinforcement learning, the whole point is that for any environment, okay, where I don't know anything about the environment, which means that uh, what I know is that I can play a bunch of actions, okay. So I can, you know, for example, think of the uh, finance setting, right? Portfolio uh, optimization. I care about making money every time I make a decision. That's every day, uh, and I make I can make decisions, which is you know uh, buy, hold, sell, or whatever, uh, and then I see what the outcome is on that day of the market, right? Uh, but I don't know everything about the uh, market. You know how is it going to evolve in the future? Okay, but I, but my objective is still to uh, uh, maximize the cumulative sum of uh, rewards. You know, individual rewards that I get every day. Right. Uh, so but, so there I have to learn. I have to learn what is the you know if if the market was in certain condition, if I bought, what would have happened is something that you have to learn over time. Okay. Uh, or if market was the same certain condition, and if I, if I had sold, what would have happened? Right. You would not know a priori unless you try it out. Uh, so, uh, so, so you have to learn those, 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 those things. Okay. Although the end goal is to maximize the reward, to maximize the cumulative reward, you have to learn something. Okay, about your environment. And and if you don't know anything about the environment a priori, that's fine. You'll still be able to learn. You may say that you know that's that's uh, that's what at, at least in the essence uh, this this whole RL uh, problem or online learning problem is about. But of course, you could be very inefficient, right? If you if you think of let's say hundred different actions that they could take in every every state or every context, every situation, and there's so many situations over time. Then you can't really explore everything, okay? And maybe you only get one chance, or you may only get ten chances to do do so. Then you can't really explore, okay? Uh, so there is those concerns as well. Yeah. So, so professor, in the in this game of chess, so so you will yeah. be giving reward to the entire episode, or or just you know like a single action, like you know like we saw like you showed in the the pong game. Yeah, yeah. So unlike Pong or, or many of these Atari games, uh, in in the game of chess, uh, we will only get a reward, which is the at the end of the game. Okay, it's, okay. it's called a sparse reward situation. So you either win or lose at the end of the game. So, so we don't have any episode. immediate reward. Yeah. yeah. So for the complete episode, we'll be you know like getting a yes. reward. Yes. 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 Okay. So, so for the full episode, to... there's only one reward, which is at the end of the game, mm -hmm. which is either zero yeah. or one. Okay. Okay. So like we'll have to, you know, like, do we, you know, have to like uh, train the model by, you know, like playing a chess, like say hundred or, you know, like a million yeah. times. And then, you know, like which yes. in whichever actions, whichever episodes we, we won, it will yes. be getting a reward. Thing. Yes. 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 So it's a very, very messy problem. Let's, let's talk about it towards the <laughs> end. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, essentially what you do. So this is very different. So you can think of the reward for every move to be essentially zero because mm -hmm. you don't get any reward. Right. Yes. But you can think of the if you, if you eventually won, maybe the reward is plus one or something, or plus hundred or whatever. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah. So there's this this reward is delayed. So the action that you took today, uh, are the chess opening. So openings have so many uh, nuances, right? I mean, people who play chess, mm -hmm. you know, there's certain uh, types of openings and different types of openings have different characteristics. So the opening move, the value of that opening move can only be determined once the game ends and, and maybe the ends in a victory or a loss, mm -hmm. okay? So yeah. the action that you took uh, several moves before has a longer term consequence, right? So okay. uh, that's characteristic, not just in chess, chess is a deterministic environment, uh, is, a, is a game nonetheless. Uh, that's true for many uh, of these um, uh, environments where there is the sequential dependency, like, like the driving example I showed, of course, if you break, uh, then you're gonna lose velocity and so you may consume more time to get to your destination. So there are, you know, there's a consequence for the actions that you take today on things that are going to transpire tomorrow or in the future. Okay, whether it's rewards or next states or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. And and like one last question, Professor, would you mind, you know, like giving uh, this Marco decision process, you know, like explaining it in terms of that since we are, you know, like learning the chess game. So like, how would you? Uh, in chess, so chess is a very, uh, I would say, not really, uh, there's no stochasticity in chess. So think of the board. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, uh, so some number of uh, uh, let's say so so recall MDP is basically uh, you know you can to specify a macro decision process you have to al always say what's the states what's a bunch of actions uh, what's the 
transition probabilities, what's the, uh, okay, I, yeah, what's the transition probabilities, what's the rewards, and if there's a discounting, okay? This is, this is pretty much it, okay? Uh, so for, for, for chess, is not a very conventional MDP, but let's say if you want to talk in terms of MDP, then the states would be every board state. Okay, so for every situation of pawns being at different different locations, not all pawns, right? So, so sometimes there will be only uh, very few towards the later part of the games. There'll be very few. So every board state is a is a is a state for you. Okay, mm -hmm. so there are so many, right? So billions of them. Uh, so that would be your state set. You you say every pawn whether it's present or not on the on the board, and if it is present, which location is present? Okay, okay. for both you and the opponent. Okay, that's the that's the state. Okay. And actions would be actually actions are not universal, so actions are constrained by which state you're in. So for every state, there is an action set. Because for example, if you only have the king on the board and nothing else, then you, your mm -hmm. actions are limited to just moving the king, right? So yeah. you have to characterize all these sets. Okay, so just move the king, you know, whatever the king moves are. Uh, and, and so on. Okay, for every state, you have to characterize this. And generally, uh, when I when I generally write A, I'm thinking of every state, every action is allowed. But that's not true. From some some you know environments, every every state, every action is not allowed. For example, okay. in the finance setting, every action is allowed, right? Whether unless you have, you know, maybe you can short stocks or whatever. But every day, you can pro probably buy, sell, and hold uh, without any restrictions. But in chess, of course, depending on the state, you may not be able to do some actions. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Now the P, uh, the transition probability is very is it's not really a probability matrix anymore. It's just saying what is the probability of going to state S prime, given I'm in state S and took an action A, and that's very clear. There's not it's, it is basically a deterministic thing, mm -hmm. because if the board was uh, like this, and I said move this guy, uh, you know, uh, one step forward, then clearly the next state is exactly the same board with that guy one step forward. Right. Okay. So the next yeah. state is, you know, there's nothing going on with the transition probability. And rewards are basically everything is zero, except for when, uh, you know, if there are some board states and some actions for which you will realize a checkmate or, you know, uh, or you got the king or whatever. So for only for them, there's a one and everything else is zero. Okay. By the way, in all this, I'm kind of ignoring the opponent player. Mm -hmm. Right, so that because that's part of an environment. So if I'm the player, everything else is part of the environment. Certainly, the opponent is player is not stochastic or anything. The opponent player is actually, uh, you know, is also trying to win. Uh, but we'll get to that nuance, you know, when we talk about uh, a different game go later. Okay, but but this is fine. Okay, so the states are defined, actions are defined, transition problems are deterministic because there's only a few bunch of rules that every uh, type of pawn can only do certain types of moves. Right, uh, so that's deterministic. How the states change? States is like. Basically, think of it as the top view of the board board of chess, mm -hmm. you know, the chess board. Yeah. Um, so the for the every, yeah. So for the it's for the every current state, you know, like it will in the in the previous games we played, it will you know like try to assess that and you know like suppose the current suppose you know like in the currently a board is ha board has you know like a party particular you know a, some yeah. some pawns at a particular location and yeah. then you know like in some of the previous games that we trained our model on you know like yeah. if we move if we move particular pawn on to the you know like a next stage or something mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. like and then we and then you know like at the end we got a you know like reward so it will yeah. try to you know like move that way like this those will be the stages that will be captured yeah exactly so we need to learn a policy which goes from you know which goes from a given state what action to take right so it could be deterministic, deterministic policy and we discussed that slightly here right what is yep. a yeah. policy so basically hopefully from previous chess games we learn a good policy which mm -hmm. hope you know from previous games it saw that for this action eventually it led to a victory or eventually it led to a, a loss hopefully based on that it decides that okay you know mm -hmm. in the future when i saw the state this action is the right thing to do or not Okay. Yeah, and that's so, captured yeah. using this policy function. Okay, yeah. So it will be based on the based on the state and the action, both of you know, like combination of them. No, no. Given the state, you need to decide the actions, right? Okay. So you know, in the state, let's say there are only four four pawns, and you know, like say three soldiers and one, you know, king and then one rook or something. Mm -hmm. So then the actions are only determined by only moving them, right? So okay, yeah. among them, which one to make? Based on my history of uh, you know, in similar situations, I did something. And you know, I won or lost, uh, won or lost. So actually, this is not really solved as an MDP, by the way, in reality, uh, <laughs> uh, because the state space is too big, and uh, and so they're slightly different. We're going to go back to a planning variation of this uh, mm -hmm. towards the end if we if we have time. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. So so that 
to decide that best policy? Does it consider to reinforce uh, RL or that is something else that how we how we decide that policy? Yeah, yeah. So Pi has to be learned, right? So that's the learning part. So uh, you can so actually you can apply RL any of the RL algorithms. And right now we're going to look at one algorithm. Actually, there are many many algorithms. This is a big big area of of, of uh, with a lot of inter interesting ideas. So we'll look at one algorithm called Q-learning. Okay, so that will eventually give you a, a good policy in any MDP. Okay, okay. Um, uh, but we have to learn this, yes. Um, and, and we'll see some techniques to learn it, okay. And that may maybe make it clear. So we haven't, so just like in supervised learning, we start with, you know, day one itself, how to learn the function, which maps from, let's say, context to classes, right? Uh, let's say classification problem. Uh, we just look at only linear squares and, and so on. So we immediately jump to how to learn this. So, but so far we have not done that. Okay. 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 Uh, we'll, we'll do that. Uh, in fact, in the next 10 minutes in, in a in certain way, and then we'll get to RL version of it. So what's the difference between RL and, and MDP, right? I'm, I'm using the MDP formalism. So in RL, you will, you'll not, you don't need to know everything about the environment a priori. So that was the point, right? So with, uh, with somebody we, we just discussed earlier. So you don't need to know like you will get states. So think of in the RL setting, the minimum thing requirement is you just need to play some actions and the other person has to respond back with uh, uh, states and, uh, you know, respond back with uh, rewards and next states. That's all. Okay. As long as you have an API, so think of you as an agent or a software programmer yourself, right? Uh, think of playing a game, right? So I, my API is if I take, take an action, do I get the reward? Uh, and I, you know, and I, see something else or there that is the game I did I lose the game or whatever right so some API which says take an action give me something some feedback okay so in RL you don't need to know this P and R a priori okay but in uh, but uh, if you know them a priori then that problem is called planning okay so uh, just to so RL there has to be some learning right so you have to learn something from the environment if everything is known about the environment uh, you can certainly apply RL by just ignoring <laughs> you know, the things that you know about the environment as well. But if you know everything about the environment, it's not really an RL problem. Okay? So uh, when I say everything about the environment, I'm talking about environment is precisely characterized by say, you know, basically the transition probabilities and the reward function. So if you know uh, those two a priori, then it's just a planning problem. So given that we know everything about the environment, which is these two objects, the probability transition, uh, the tra this, this type of transition stuff, as well as the reward function, then you should just plan what is the uh, plan. And the plan's output is also, again, a policy, OK? Um, so planning's output is a policy. RL's output is also a policy. But RL will uh, is in a more, I guess, stricter and stricter situation or a more stringent uh, problem because you, do, you, don't, you haven't been given explicitly what the transition probability function, for example, uh, as well as the reward function is, OK? So it's less information. You still have to produce a policy in RL uh, in, in the problem. So, so, so that policy, so like in very simple terms, when we first start learning about search algorithm or so yeah. there was a question like what happens in, you know, when, when the machine plays chess, whether you do DFS or BFS and yeah. nothing seems right because it will take so long to yes. exist. It's yes. a really big space. Yeah. So, so, so those, like, those, that would be all planning algorithms, okay? Uh, breadth for search uh, and whatever, uh, depth for search and variations like that, they will all be related to planning and we'll see something. Okay. Like and so, so what we are trying to find that policy, it's just a better alternative of that searching algorithm. No, right? no, no. After you search, uh, the end of the search, you will figure out a, you know, a move, right? A move to make. That's what is encoded as a function here. So, okay. So what move to make is the A that you need to pick. Right. Um, so, yeah. So basically, you know, after the search process, let's say you are in some chessboard situation, okay, and and then you do some search, okay, maybe red first search or depth first search or something. Uh, after do after like, the search completes, you know what action to take, right? So, like for example, this function def pi, which takes a state, could do you know search, search for some time, and then return a, okay, return. for example, okay. So, so where do we decide what search is better? Is, is it like a part of something else or is it like that's what uh, RL will help us find that what search is better or what method to use to find next move? Uh, so RL's objective is to say in every state what to do, <laughs> which action to take. Okay. Yeah. Whether you figure out that which action to take using a search procedure or 
some other way it's not so uh, that's, you know uh, that's like a planning planning part to optimize your search and have a like a... uh so uh, okay so i guess uh, your question is like where do search algorithms come into picture they they don't actually so not every environment even needs that okay only in chess maybe you need it and chess problem as i said is not really an rl problem you can consider okay. it as an rl problem uh but chess is actually just a search problem search and planning is the same thing okay by the way planning optimization search is all the same yeah, uh, yeah. stuff uh so uh but in rl at the end of the day as i said for planning as well as search the end object is in a given situation context what to do you know that's like a function like this right so within that function whether it's a search or algorithm or not depends on the actual problem okay so uh, so so the game that you showed in the start of the class that uh, atari game atari game yeah so 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 whether to move to left or right how, like where does that learning come from like do we say okay deterministic they do this or it learns uh you mean uh, let's say breakout uh oh no yeah let's play this uh maybe so this is the breakout game yeah, right? yeah. not pong but very similar yeah okay uh so whether it does left or right it is it is learning by trial and error so the left and right are the actions so okay i'll tell you a big quick teaser on what is this uh, how does it map to an mdp or how does it map to an environment in our case in our rl setting right the screenshot is the input okay given the screenshot of the of what you're seeing here basically okay the screenshot is the input the output is you know left or right basically okay Okay, and basically all the joystick moves you have. Uh, I think in Atari games, I think you have eighteen joystick moves. Okay, uh, but doesn't matter. So just think of left or right. Uh, so all I'm saying is, given the screenshot, it says go go left or go right. Okay, and and then uh, the environment responds back as saying, oh, because you went left or right, what happened next? Okay, that's the next screenshot. Okay. Okay. Each screenshot you can think of that as a state. Yep. Okay. and in fact uh, you can think of the screenshot as including the top score thing as well which is increasing over time and so the reward is basically what changed from the previous screenshot to the next screenshot in terms of this this number change okay so you can do for example an ocr if you want to figure out what are the two numbers of the two screenshots and subtract them if you want yeah yeah okay but in so that's that's the rewards uh, transitions are you know the environment so in this case we don't know what the stochastic transition is okay uh i don't know if there's any stochasticity in this model but uh, uh sorry in this environment but it's basically a black box for us right we don't know what the p is or what the r is okay um we can just interact with this uh, black box api or this atari game itself to get a sense of oh if i try this if i try that you know what what's going to happen okay so that's the rl setting if you knew exactly the rules of the game i mean here i guess with games you kind of know what the rules are with based on physics or something uh for example with doom right so let's go back to doom here it's it's stochastic right so i turn this way i turn that way enemies can come up here wherever right so there's no rules uh, the rules are certainly when when i take a certain action if there is an enemy right in that line uh, then maybe you know they'll they'll get killed right so mm. Uh, in this one, in this game, professor, wouldn't be you know like we get a a a much better accuracy with a deep neural network with you know like a feed forward, and yeah. a, you know like a back propagation since you know like the environment is changing constantly like so yeah. you know like yeah so exactly and and uh, okay so that's a good point so here you may say okay why can't I just take the screenshot as an input and have an output which is a which is basically a multi class classification for mm-hmm. example. which says you know uh, the classes would be you know turn right turn right turn right shoot now yeah. or not right so that's exactly what's going on but exa- what i'm trying to say is that that learning uh, uh you know maybe for okay even for doom there's a longer term consequence of the action you're taking now for example if you take a left action and it just makes you go towards you know makes you go behind a wall then you cannot take a right action anymore because you're behind a separation oh, okay. for example and maybe miss a reward for the next 10 round text the next 10 times steps for example so this okay. is long term aspect which is what we are trying to capture otherwise yeah you can certainly apply supervised learning here okay you can be short you can be myopic as in the you know for the current action what happened right next and just train based on that that would be supervised learning yeah if okay, you can so if you can extract a reward signal yeah 
Okay, so so RL would you know like give us a long term benefits and you know like when it comes to like getting rewards and all those things. So RL would you know like get us a, a long term benefit of you know like if we perform certain action, what will what are you know like a consequences of having some other act you know like a state in the future. Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, yeah. There, let me recap a couple of things here. Uh, so RL. Uh, Uh, so in supervised learning, for example, you need you need training data, right? So this training data cannot be this just this environment. You need all the screenshots of all the actions that you took, and not maybe not everything, but you know a bunch of screenshots, that's a bunch of actions that you took, and what happened next, right? Uh, here in RL, it's actually doing online, okay, in in a for loop where um, uh, there's dependency from one observation to the next observation, right? So if the first observation I took a certain action, the next observation is going to be, you know, what's the consequence of that action, and then what action I do. So there is this temporal uh, dependency across time, which is not present in supervised okay. learning. There's also okay. the need for exploration, which is you know in supervised learning there is uh, you can certainly when in the data collection phase you can do some exploration, which means that in different same screenshot you can try out a bunch of different actions if you want. So there are a bunch of uh, fundamental differences like that. Okay. Okay. Maybe Thank maybe you. let's revisit it uh, again uh, when we look at actually a learning algorithm. We have not seen a algorithm which learns by okay that the function which maps from This like a uh, screenshot to uh, uh, action, right? So we have not seen any algorithm right now. Mm-hmm. So let's look at one algorithm and then come back. Yeah, thanks to this question. Uh, yeah, there's a question uh, on games like Minesweeper. Yes, of course. Uh, yeah, yeah, Minesweeper will be also a game. Uh, so any environment, right? So as long as you have control on. Uh, uh you know you have the control on like you know turning on and off a certain cells uh for example in minesweeper and and uh the environment responds by uh you know uh giving you some rewards and and some other things appear randomly and so on so that's the environment so you can certainly you build an rl agent which plays as well as a human okay that's that's what these games things are doing okay this is just a proof of concept basically uh but things like self driving or doing rl so people for example also apply reinforcement learning for personalization in uh, recommendation systems right so there the user state is user seeing some screen i displayed a bunch of objects uh, user responded with a bunch of clicks and then the next screen because the user you know maybe displayed disinterest on the bunch of first bunch of things i should figure out what's the next set of things to show okay so there's uh, you know there is the you can apply rl there okay that would be more real life example uh, and uh, and one simpler simpler version of rl is contextual bandits where the next state doesn't depend on the previous state and so that was deployed and, and we saw an example with uh, i think amazon.com or bing.com one of those uh, two two lectures ago uh difference between rl and uh, online machine learning it's actually the same right so so think of rl as a part of online machine learning so uh, let's come back here so this for loop here is is the for loop that i wrote for rl okay so uh what you know so so the so so if in terms of sets right so or in terms of inclusion so this is rl okay there will be contextual bandits inside and there will be multi angle bandits inside okay so this is all our online machine learning okay uh so the only difference with i guess uh contextual bandits is that you will not get the next state uh so this is the rl template for every time step you see a state you play an action you get a reward on next state okay so there are four things no st at rt plus 1 st plus one, four things but if you drop one of these the ones i the one i circled here if you drop it then it just becomes a contextual bandit setting okay where agency is a context but the next time period st plus 1 the context that they see has nothing to do with the previous state and the previous action that you took okay so if you drop the circle thing then it's a contextual bandit setting and if you drop the first part of this loop uh, then it's essentially a multi on bandit setting okay and these are all online machine learning settings okay online just means you're you're um you know you're basically trying to dynamically figure out what's the best thing to do okay uh which is different from i mean best thing to do so we are really thinking about decisions right so so that's where i think i also motivated in a couple of lectures ago where a supervised learning you can think of that as for simplistic decisions let's say give somebody a loan or not sure supervised learning algorithms output is also a decision right to give somebody a loan or not but if you are um, you can think of decisions as uh, something a little bit more general than uh, just predictions in the sense that for example one extreme case could be you could have multiple predictions feeding into you and then you make 
a single decision, right? So that can happen, for example, in portfolio optimization that you have multiple predictions of expected returns in the next, you know, next week or something. And then based on all of that, given, given your capacity constraint of how much budget you have to, you know, uh, like buy things, you would buy, let's say two or three of the promising stocks. So uh, a decision can be more complicated than uh, just a prediction. But the, you know, the blur, you know, the difference between them is quite blurry. So, uh, so but anyway, online machine learning is, uh, is basically this for loop here. And RL is a part of that, essentially. Uh, and and I guess online machine learning, uh, people use uh, it for more to talk about contextual bandits and bandits. I think the right uh, phrase or terminology that people use for RL uh, in addition to reinforcement learning, it's called sequential decision making. Probably, okay, sequential decision making. It's just things happen. You know, you take decisions again and again and again. You get feedback again and again and again. Okay, that's why it's a problem. So uh, with that, let's come back here. Um, yeah. Yeah. So let's, uh, so where did we stop last time? Uh, so what I was trying to say, let's come back to uh, where I wanted to start with. So we said there's a Marco chain, let's add rewards. It becomes a Marco reward process. Let's add actions, it becomes a Marco uh, decision process. Okay, so process just means think of it as a sequence of random variables. Okay, a Marco chain is essentially you can also call it a Marco process if you want. Uh, so it's just a sequence of random variables. Uh, but rewards you have extra random variables, the reward random variables. And decision process you have extra, I wouldn't say random variables. It they could be random variables, but extra decisions that come into the picture. Okay, uh, so an MDP, which is basically state actions. Uh, this transition probability matrix or a transition probability function and the reward function, you know, there are actions, but if you already specify a policy, then it just becomes a Marco reward process. Okay, why is that? Because, you know, a policy is basically from every, for every state, it's already telling you what, what action to take, right, for every state. So there's no need for explicit, uh, you know, you, you're not doing anything more, right? Once you already say, oh, here's MDP and here's a policy that you have to, you know, use, then you don't have any you know, control on actions anymore because the policy is already telling you what action to take. In, in that sense, the, therefore the process just runs by itself, right? So it's like, oh, from one random variable to the next, here's the next state that I reached and here's the reward that I got because I applied uh, a specific policy, okay? Uh, then that sequence of states is basically uh, as a Marco chain, uh, you know, it's basically a Marco process and the state and the rewards, you know, given these two objects, this one and this one, uh, this sequence becomes a Marco reward process. Okay, uh, so Marco reward process also has a, uh, also has a transition probability function and the reward function. Uh, that those two functions are slightly different from the functions for the Marco addition process. Okay, and the slight difference is that the action is now specified by the policy already. Okay, so basically instead of going from state to uh, sorry state to state and action to next state, I have to go from state to next state. Okay, that's what this right-hand side is, this our left-hand side is saying. So somehow you have to get rid of action and that's possible because you already have a policy which tells you what action to take. Okay, similarly, same thing uh, here, you have to, uh, uh, you know, so this action is not free. I mean, the policy pretty much determines what, what reward you get. Okay, because so, it so, uh, pretty much tells you what, what's, the, what's the state, yeah. Uh, so I have a question, Professor. So, so this one we can we can implement in the problem where you know like environment is somehow you know like a constant. Like suppose say for a game of Mario where you know like mm -hmm. the environment is stable and so you know like we get a particular state every time and yeah. then you know like the next state next you know like action would be or uh, next state would be you know like so if we just move 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 forward yeah. or you know like yeah. make a jump or so next state yeah. would be you know like. So, uh, so the uh, gap between reality and this, this, this uh, you know, use of symbols to explain my prediction process is that uh, games don't have an explicit uh, characterization of uh, this. Um, uh, so games, uh, you, you don't have a direct access to this guy and this guy. You can only get them. So, you, so these, think of this as a model of the environment. So we don't have a model of the game. So we have a simulator or we have the game itself, right? Where mm -hmm. we can play action, we get back something. Uh, but we don't have a model of it. Okay, so these are. This is called. Uh, I guess this pretty much is, is the model. Okay. Okay. So we don't have it for for a game. Okay. So if you had if you had explicitly these objects, transition probability function and the reward function, then the problem is not reinforcement learning because you already have the model. You have you know everything about the environment if you know these two, and so the problem would be a planning problem. 
okay okay uh, in a game like mario or the games that we saw atari games uh, we don't have direct access to these guys but we can certainly play you know play with the game and get samples right so mm-hmm. for example if i'm in state little less i take some action you know uh, jump or turn left or whatever uh, i can see what the next next state is but i cannot i don't know what's the probability unless i try out this using this you know using the game i try out 100 different times and 100 different states thousand you know many many times then i can maybe get an estimate of this transition okay probability. okay yeah and then suppose say for a you know like a self driving car so we if we you know like set a current location and you yeah. know like we set a final location so in that yeah. case we'll be yeah. knowing these two guys right because uh, then we'll be knowing the action for every state where we are no 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 so it depends on what the so uh, the self driving uh, example if you just uh, you know i guess simplify simplify it uh then it depends on the state description okay state could be both the measurements from lidar radar as well as cameras i mean multiple cameras that whole thing could be the state okay so it's it's a really complicated thing and it's going to okay. change over time given that whole state you take a, a immediate action let's say you know a brake or accelerate or turn left turn right whatever so minor mm-hmm. things control things then the next state would be the next bunch of camera snapshots and next bunch of lidar okay. measurements next bunch of radar measurements and so on Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. How does that transpire? It could be by laws of physics, right? So if if you know, uh, you know, in, in some situations, it, this transition is you know is possible to capture. But I think even for self driving, it's not. You don't have access to this. Okay. There are much much messier messier problems. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, if you if you do a very simple three D simulation in, in on the computer and in exactly. a, in a virtual like a virtual you know car you know let's say. Uh, yeah like some sort of a driving simulator or something then yeah you can get maybe these these objects yeah exactly yeah so that's what you know like i was thinking about okay so actually um we are quite delayed <laughs> but uh, okay so let's uh, anyway uh, try to make as much progress as possible so uh um yeah so i was talking about mdp is an mrp and so why do we need these intermediate objects and why don't we just directly talk about games and trying to learn a policy is that uh the intermediate objects that we talked about last time the value function especially is an important component of a popular algorithm in the space okay and the popular algorithm is called q learning and one of the i mean all these games that we saw just now breakout and uh, flappy bird version as well as doom as well as you know uh, somebody asked about pong all those games were you know agent was was able to play the algorithm underlying uh the learning of the policy of the policy which says you know in different screenshots what should what should do uh that algorithm relies on these this value function okay the state action value function uh, so that's why last time we talked about value function quite a bit and we also briefly introduced uh, uh okay we're going to revisit it but we introduced uh state action value function okay so value function is something critical and to understand a value function we need to look at this this additional symbols and so on and understand the mdp formulas a little bit okay um and it also makes uh things a little bit more clear i think for first time uh, i guess beginners it seems like a lot of a lot of uh, symbols floating around but as i said the number of objects is pretty limited okay it's just bunch of states they're only f- limited but not you know one or two but so states actions uh, transition probabilities reward functions and discounting and then the f- a couple of more policy and then a value function so those are pretty much the ingredients needed for pretty much designing any algorithm and later and later maybe in the second half of this lecture we're going to talk about uh, come back to deep learning and and look at how that helps in dealing with these more complex uh, environments right so even the game environment that we saw pong and breakout they're not easy to work with uh, uh, is you know easy to work with so we can use uh, some other so some of the things that you've seen uh, Uh, some of the things that you've seen in uh, for example using cnns and so on we can actually use cnns to understand the screenshot okay so that's the um, that's where that's why we are well there is a choice we made how do i answer this okay let's go back to draw okay uh, so that's why we're looking at uh, look at the, looking at these things okay uh, uh where are we okay so let's uh, uh, so let me tell you what the short term goal is in the, in the sense in the next 15 minutes we want to get to a point where we can talk about this algorithm that i was i was i mentioned earlier which is q learning okay 
So in the next 15 minutes, we just want to get a sense of an algorithm, a single algorithm. Okay, uh, but there are many, many algorithms in the space, but let's talk about one algorithm. How does it learn policy pi? Okay, so we want to get to this policy or this function, which goes from stage to actions. We want to know how to learn it. Okay, it's not it's it's not a difficult algorithm to learn, but for that we need to understand what are value functions. Okay, and we already discussed this last time. A value function is nothing but the expectation of the return random variable. And what is the return random variable? GT is nothing but if you're in state S, for example, if it's a Markov reward process, if you're in state S and and we had a Markov reward process. If, if the policy is already specified, then GT is nothing but RT plus one uh, all the way to our, you know, whatever is the, you know, maybe even our infinity uh, expectation of it. Okay, I think I did a bad job here. Uh, equality, but there's an expectation and operation. Okay, uh, I, I can't put it there, but uh, okay. So that's the return random variable. G, sorry, I apologize. Uh, the random variable itself is just a sum of the rewards. Okay. I mean, these are random variables and therefore the sum of the random variables is a random variable, okay? And the expectation of that random variable is called the value of that state, you know, uh, in an MDP, okay? Given the policy, so the policy is important. Given a policy, the MDP is nothing but a Markov reward process. If it's a Markov reward process, every state has some value. How do I get that value? By just taking the expectation over this uh, reward run, as a uh, expectation over this return run available. And this GT is just the sum of uh, rewards from that point onwards, from that state onwards, basically. Okay. So that state value function, there's a, there's a new value function, which is the important thing for us, for our algorithm. It's called the action value function. Okay. And the difference between the state value function and the action value function is that um, there's a second argument. Okay. So, Think of I'm in some state S, I'm taking, I get a degree of freedom, which is an action to take, okay? I take an action, I get to some next state, uh, S prime, and from S prime onwards, I apply the given policy pi, okay? So uh, in other words, let me uh, use this space here. So V pi of S is just saying, okay, oh, you already given me pi, what's the value of being in the state? is nothing but because I'm already in the state, tell me what's the reward I can get, right? Uh, uh, for being in the state and taking the action pi of s, right? Uh, because pi is already given, so I'll take that action. So this is the reward. Yeah. But the next time, uh, once I take this action, I'll get to some other state. So maybe that state is s prime, let's say it's s prime. Then what's the reward at that s prime when I take the action pi of s prime, okay? Uh, and so on. So this, you know, I use this letter just to search, you know, kind of, uh, kind of include the expectation. So value is nothing but the sum of these guys, okay? some of these expected rewards that I can get. Okay. Of course, this S prime uh, requires you to know, you know, taking expectation here and all that. Uh, or in other words, uh, what I'm saying is this V pi of S is the expectation over the trajectory. So I'm already at S, so there's all the randomness that can happen in the future is S prime can happen. Uh, reward RT plus can happen, RT plus one. Let's say S is at time T, RT plus one can happen. Uh, and then S T plus two can happen, R T plus two can happen and so on. So all these are random variables, right? The expectation is to that time, bunch of, this is, a, this is called a trajectory. Okay, a trajectory of states, next states, rewards and so on. Okay, in this trajectory, there's also this extra uh, variables that I missed, uh, which are pi of st plus one. So actually this, let's call this st plus one. Pi of st plus one, pi of st plus two, and so on, okay? Because pi is already given, these, you know, the output of pi is given, but given the state, the output could be a random action depending on if the policy was um, deterministic or, uh, or a stochastic policy. But uh, more than that, a trajectory is nothing but state, actions, rewards, state, actions, rewards, and so on, okay? So the expectation with respect to that, that's the value. Now, what is state action value function? Q pi of S comma I, since there's an extra argument, uh, the idea is that state action value function is what's the reward you can get if you're in state S and you take an action A, but from next time step onwards, you take the actions uh, determined by pi which is that, you know, let's say you went to a state S prime, then you take pi of S prime. Uh, from there, let's say you went to state S double prime, 
from there you take uh, action uh, five of s double, s double prime and so on so just the first time you have you can choose an action different from what pi is suggesting and then from the next time period on let's just apply you know exactly what um, your policy suggests that's the only difference okay that's why there's a second argument it's a one degree extra degree of freedom that you can choose okay that's called the uh, state action um, state action value function so you can pick the first uh, uh, given that you're in state s you can pick the first action to be little a which could be different or could be the same as pi what pi is suggesting and from that point onwards uh you you can in the future just keep applying uh uh what pi suggests and that's the you know there will be corresponding return random variable okay uh so corresponding returns right so depending on whatever actions you take you still get a bunch of uh, uh r's um so the sum of those r's is basically the expectation of g okay g is the return random variable so that's what a state action value function is is that clear or um so we'll kind of work with this uh, and come up with an algorithm which learns uh, a good uh, which which learns policy which learns a policy from experience from data from previous uh, training uh, don't we have this factor gamma that's the discount factor uh, yes great point uh, i have sorry yeah. i have missed it uh, but i think it's why is it not going up okay um uh, yeah i could have added gamma here actually Uh, gamma, uh, gamma square, and so on. Gamma. Is it like uh, an option, or it's just to adjust weights? As that's it. Right? Uh, yeah, there's or... several reasons why you need gamma because you know it's it's basically I don't know some of you who have done finance. There's this time value of money, right? Uh, it's a discounting. You know what what you have today is more more valuable than what you have what you may get tomorrow, right? Uh, so you have some you know there's a similar idea here. Basically, the rewards that you get today, you can up you know make them more important by having this discounting term gamma uh, okay uh, which discounts the future rewards that you get okay yeah uh, but uh, you know if 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 your marco diffusion process never stops okay there is no terminating state uh, then you can't add up all the rewards you know because some of all those rewards will be infinity so if you have a discounting then the even as long as the rewards are finite for example all the reward numbers can only be at most uh, 10 units or something Then if you put a, a, a discounting, then thus you know even if there is an infinite sum, the the sum is still a finite value. Yeah. Okay. Even if there are infinite terms. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so given uh, these two value functions, uh, state action value function and the uh, state value function, state value function, uh, uh, we already saw this recursion last time when we were talking about Markov reward process, which is that the value function, so the value of a state. is related to while is related to values at uh, at succeeding states or future states okay or other states which is that uh, when i say recursion uh, it's just a recursive relationship which is that the value of a state is related to value of some other states okay and uh, the relationship is that the value of a state is is the uh, expectation of the of the reward that you can get by taking an action at that state which is by using pi and then because you took an action at that state you landed in some other state let's call it st plus 1 at that state uh, at that state there is an expected you know there's a, there's a value for that state it's just that, that that state is random so that's why we are using a capital letter s there because um uh, the future state can be random and then from that state from at that state there's a value for every, any of those you know states uh, you know, any of the realizations of that random state st plus 1 uh so the sum of that discounted future value uh at those states that can realize plus the current reward uh expectation of that is is the uh current value at a, at a given state little s okay so this recursion um uh, we saw a quick uh derivation last time uh and derivation just follows from the fact that this is actually equal to expectation of r t plus 1 plus r t plus 2 let's say gamma Plus gamma square r t plus three onwards, right? So given the same thing, s t is equal to s. So this sum here, you can see if I take gamma for the uh, second term onwards, take gamma outside, okay? Then it's like r t plus two plus gamma times r t plus three plus gamma square times r t plus four and so on. So that's still an infinite sum. So that infinite sum, you can just uh, compress it as be again a value function, okay? 
So you can do that because if you recall value function, it's just recursive definition, right? The value function is a bunch of reward terms. If you remove the first term, it's still a bunch of reward terms. So you can just substitute the value, but it's going to be at a different state because that, you know, it's, it's about RT plus two, which is that state at ST plus one. Okay. Anyway, the punchline is that there is a recursive relation for the uh, value function. Okay. Uh, and similarly, there's a recursive relation for, for the state action value function as well, which is again, the immediate reward plus some discounting times uh, the next, uh, 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 the next state action value function. Okay, where now there are two random variables, S as well as A, okay? And uh, these are determined by pi and the transition probability uh, function of the of the Markov addition, Markov addition process. Okay, so these recursions are gonna be important because, uh, you know, just to give a teaser of what type of an algorithm we'll have, we'll have an algorithm uh, where, you know, these recursive relations will tell us that, okay, if you want to somehow compute a good policy, uh, pi, then you will have to, let's say you want to, uh, uh, okay, what I'm trying to say is that to compute uh, pi, we will make use of these recursions in a particular way, which is that we'll, we can, just like in uh, gradient descent, we were using old values of weights, and then there was some gradient update, and that would be new values of weights, right? So you can think of the right, left-hand side as some new values of this, these value functions, and the left hand uh, on the right hand side to be old values of these value functions. So given the old values, let's say here and here, you compute the right hand side and just update the uh, left hand side to be the right hand side. I'm gonna again explain this, but the intuition uh, with this recursion is that recursion is gonna be very useful for the design of an algorithm to learn pi eventually. Uh, but uh, yeah, so let's do it in steps. So. Uh, but professor, uh, yeah. if you choose a policy pi, then yeah. this a t plus one is kind of the same thing, right? Like the action is kind of fixed as you, or uh, after the first step, the action is kind yeah, of. Yeah, this is going to be pi of s t plus one. Yes, we could use that. Yeah, yeah, good point. Um, yeah, that's true. This is actually uh, correct. Uh, okay, so the same expression here, q pi of s comma a. We're gonna write it in, uh, in more explicit form okay, by, by somehow removing this expectation. We're gonna, of course, make use of this recursion. So there's no running sum of returns, okay? The whole point of, so recall the basic definition of value function had this whole running sum of rewards, okay? We wanna drop those rewards at least, and you'll see that we can just maintain the first reward from reward value, the reward random variable RT plus one, and somehow have this recursive relationship so that we can have a you know, smaller representation of these, these uh, value functions, right? So, uh, so if I expand this expectation, so Q pi of S comma A is going to be related to the current reward at the state little s, okay, by taking action little a, right? This a is this a, this is this less, plus a discount, and that's exactly the discount here, uh, plus a discount, plus the summation. What is the summation? This is an expectation, okay? So the sum over probability, so it's an, actually an expectation. This is actually expectation with respect to S prime given S and A. Okay, so of, of some quantity. Okay, and this summation is actually an expectation with respect to pi, because you know you can have a pi which is non-deterministic, which could be stochastic, which means that it's a distribution over actions. So that's that expectation. Okay, of Q pi of uh, S prime and A prime. Okay, so basically S prime is this guy, uh, pi is gonna determine A, A prime. So you can think of, this there's this recursive relation as saying that if you know q prime at so q at uh, q pi at uh, s prime a prime for a bunch of you know future states and future actions okay that you can take then you can compute q pi of s comma a okay, that's the relationship but it's circular right if you know uh, let's say there are only 10 10 states uh, you know it's just relating a bunch of you know, q pi at a given state to a bunch of q pi at some other state and action pairs. That's all. Just think of this as a bunch of uh, linear equations, actually, um, uh, where you can think of this as a, a variable. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, what is the output? You know, like in this case. So, it is the is it the you know like a final stage and how much you know like we are accurate at that final stage. 
so we are not still yet at a stage where we are using data at all here. So we are not. Okay. So these are all recursive relations uh, are for us to understand how Q learning works. Okay. okay. Uh, when we talk about Q learning, when we will talk about uh, how are we generating data in every interaction? So come back to our for loop, right? We'll have mm -hmm. a data at every interaction that will that will Im, uh, improve some estimates that we have. Okay. And and hopefully that estimates let us let us make better decisions. Okay. And, okay. Yeah. Uh, and so there you will see the impact of data. Here we are just manipulating the recursion a uh, little bit just to get you know get clarity on what's the recursion. For example, the recursion is that Q pi is related to Q pi at other locations. Mm -hmm. uh, so other okay. state action values. Okay. Uh, let's talk about now the optimization problem. So let's say we uh, we so. Okay, so when I say the optimization problem, uh, what I'm saying is the problem uh, that we originally had maximize the cumulated rewards that we expected cumulated rewards that we collect, that problem essentially can be written as maximization or pi of v pi of s. Because remember, v pi of s is literally expectation of uh, you know GT random variable, which is exactly expectation of rewards all the way you know reward plus reward plus reward plus reward and so on, right? So that's exactly you know so so objective is clear you know. For every pi, there's a bunch of rewards that we can collect in expectation, which pi leads to the maximum expected uh, uh, sum of rewards. Okay, so let's call that v pi v star s. Okay? That's that's the optimization problem that we would like to solve. Uh, but of course, there's the missing piece of you know we don't know uh, you know we have to learn something. We'll talk about that missing piece uh, in the next few minutes. But basically, this is the optimization problem. If you had handle on for every pi, if somebody told you what's the value of uh, being in state s for every pi, every policy that you can think of, let's say, remember policies are functions. For every function, if it, if somebody else comes and tells you here's a score for that function, which is what a value function is here, then you can pick the pi which has the highest score, and that's literally optimization, right? So let's call that uh, v star of s, okay? Uh, and similarly. Uh, the pi that maximizes q pi of s comma a, let's call it q star q star of s. Okay, for uh, and you know for every s comma a, you can find a pi which maximizes uh, uh, this q value state action value, value function. Then uh, that's the uh, let's call that value q star of s. Okay, now now we'll talk about optimization. So we're going to talk about so pre previously the recursions were uh, given a pi. Q pi at uh, s, s, s a is related to Q pi at s prime a prime, some linear equation like that. It's linear equation because you can see it's just literally sum of a bunch of numbers. Okay. Um, but now we're, we're going to talk about optimization. Uh, and so uh, for that, I want to introduce an equation called Bellman optimality equation. Okay. It's a different equation than the Bellman expectation equation. So remember, so just recall the previous equation that's, that we saw here, this equation is called Bellman expectation equation, uh, named after a uh, researcher, uh, uh, you know, Dr. Bellman. Um, so uh, this optimality equation is gonna help us, uh, you know, define a Q-learning algorithm eventually, uh, you know, in a few slides. So the Bellman optimality equation is gonna say, that Q star of S comma A. So now we're talking about something that we have not really optimized, but we know that this Q star of S comma A because of Bellman optimality equation is related to uh, Q star at S prime A prime in, in this nonlinear way, okay? Why is this nonlinear? Because there's an extra max operation in between, okay? A linear just means the sum of, uh, you know, sum of terms or whatever, but there's a max operation in between. That's why this is a nonlinear equation, but this equation is called Bellman optimality equation, okay? Now this has connections to uh, the more general idea called dynamic programming. Uh, some of you might have seen dynamic programming when you did uh, maybe a computer science um, course and algorithms or something like that. Uh, basically, here the idea is that if you you know uh, there's this principle of optimality which uh, which is uh, exploited in dynamic programming, which is that uh, there's a problem uh, substructure. Okay, so basically. Uh, if you knew the optimal state action values at the succeeding states s prime a, succeeding state action pairs s prime a prime, then the optimal thing to do now is to uh, then the optimal thing to do now is to uh, uh, so the optimal thing to do now is to do max over a okay sorry arg max uh, over a find the best action now 
okay uh, that would be uh, you know sorry the action that you should take the optimal action that you should take now is going to be equal to that action such that you can get an immediate reward so such that this the sum is uh, maximized where you get an immediate reward and then reach some state s prime where you will take actions optimally according to q stem okay so what do i mean by this just to re recollect i think i didn't explain that properly is that you are at state s you want to figure out what action to take okay you want to take that action so that you can get to some state s prime and from that s prime onwards you are taking the optimal actions okay so from here onwards you are taking the optimal actions let's say the optimal actions can be taken by uh, and and i'll tell you uh, optimal actions can be taken in this way arg max over a of q star of s comma a or s prime comma a okay this is how you take an optimal action why is that because q star is literally selling you this is the uh, by definition of q star this is the highest um, uh, state action value function that you can get right so that by definition here by uh, this is how we define q star okay which is the maximum action state action value function over all policies okay so we but we are hiding the dependence on policies and we are saying oh if that is the best action value state action value i can get now tell me what action should i take because this is the highest i can get for every a so one of those a's will give me the highest you know uh, highest value from that state s prime onwards so this is the best best thing i can do from the next step okay given that this is the best thing i can do um i want to figure out what is the action to take now okay so this is the uh, basically the problem substructure so if you can so if you can figure out how to go from uh, your current state to uh, next state then from next state onwards you will act optimally so you you do you work out one step backwards what is the best action to do now okay and that uh, is essentially what this equation is capturing so if you take if you take action a you will get an immediate reward okay uh, you'll get some immediate reward and these are the probabilities which which you will get to next stage and on next stage you would act optimally and so the total reward you will get is this right so for every action little a i can tell you oh here's the immediate reward and here's the new all the new states that you can go to and from those new states you will do optimally okay and so if because you're doing optimally you'll get the maximum value that you can potentially get right given that you know so that's for this action now if i change that action again you will get some immediate reward and from the future states that i generated you will act optimally so now the question is which action to take okay mm -hmm. so that action to take is just the uh, you know that action which maximizes the q star s comma right? okay uh, and the and so uh, the bellman optimal equation is saying that uh, this equality holds okay this this problem problem substructure holds okay um so here the concept of policy is implicit as in we are more looking at the actions and then going yes back. yes 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 so instead of q star i could have said uh, pi star or something which is the optimal policy oh. you know yeah. uh, extra notation but mm -hmm. uh, it's just a dynamic programming principle so people who have not seen dynamic programming uh, uh, i think it's going to be a little difficult to understand uh, what's going on uh, basically yeah so let's so people who didn't uh, understand for them i think it's it's just okay to note that just like there's a bellman expectation equation uh, which relates you know value functions to some other value functions and uh, state action values to some other state action value functions similarly there's an equal there's another equation called bellman optimality equation which we can actually derive but let's not go into that detail uh, which also relates optimal state action value functions Uh, at a given state action pair to optimal state action value function at some other state action pair s prime a prime okay that's what's happening here okay some relation is just a nonlinear relationship because there's a max operation in this equation okay that's why i'm saying it's nonlinear now as i said okay so why are we so uh, talking about value function so much is because if you have this optimal value function then the best thing to do is to uh, take the take that action at this given state which is the maximum of these q stars so maybe there are three actions there will be q star of s comma action 1 q star of s comma action 2 q star of s comma action 3 one of these actions would have the highest q star so that's the action that that's the action for which uh, which your policy will prefer okay so that's the action that your policy should take so there's a 
So this is connecting a policy to the state action value function. Okay, so this uh, we have not seen, I think, before. So, uh, so this is how a policy and the state action value functions relate. State action value functions are related. So that's why it, it's worthwhile to estimate state action value functions well. Okay, uh, you know, using data. And so you will see Q learning is basically taking trying to estimate uh, these guys really well using historical data. Okay, because once you estimate that, you can relate it to a policy, and and hopefully, if we estimate Q star, you know, or uh, learn Q star, that means that I can, you know, my policy pi star, I can I can play policy pi star, and we know that that's the policy which maximizes uh, this expected cumulative reward because that's by definition, right? Uh, Q star is supposed to be the so the best. Okay. Um, any questions at this point before we talk about uh, Q learning? So we're gonna move to Q learning. Actually, let's take a break. Uh, from uh, let's resume at five twelve, okay, five thirteen. So let me start uh, 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 where we left off. So before I talk about Q learning, I want to uh, spend a couple of minutes. Uh, this is slide 52, right? So I want to spend a couple of minutes on the relation between the um, the value function and the state action value function, and and those diagrams that we are seeing. So this is slide 52. Uh, so let's go right now. Yeah. So I want to uh, go into uh, the appendix section just to uh, capture the you know what does what is this diagram uh, because we're going to use this diagram a couple of times. Um, just to get an understanding of uh, uh, the the relationships between value functions. So this diagram uh, is trying to show how v pi of s. So v pi, So think of states themselves being shown as a uh, uh, as a node without the without you know uh, without uh, darkening it. Basically, just an empty node uh, or this you know basically this node. Uh, is representing states, and this black node is representing state comma action. Okay, just think of uh, just to decide. So, why do I need these nodes? Is to just to draw a diagram, where hopefully uh, you can get a sense of <coughs> how the nodes are related to each other. For example, let's say for example, since this is a state, how the value function of the state is related to uh, the state action value functions at state comma. Uh, action pairs. Okay, so this is S comma A. This is S comma A prime. A, a prime. Let's say if there are only two actions, or if there are more actions, there'll be more uh, such dark, uh, you know, such black nodes. Okay, so what's the relationship between V pi of S and uh, Q pi of S comma A? Uh, this is the relationship, which is that just that. Let's say there are only two actions, then V pi of S is equal to. Um, uh, you know, uh, probability of taking action one at that state times Q pi of uh, S comma that action one plus, you know, probability of you taking action two at that state times Q pi of uh, uh, action, you know, state and action two. So basically V pi of S is just think of it as the average of Q pi of S comma A's averaged over what's the probability with which you'll take uh, uh, take any of the you know take the action according to the policy pi because it's V pi of 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 um, S okay it's basically saying that you know remember in Q pi of S comma A we said okay the the second argument is basically saying we can keep that degree of freedom as an action which is not related to pi okay because you know we from state S, we'll take an action A, which we control, and then from wherever, whichever new state we land, we're going to apply uh, the policy pi. That was what Q pi of S comma A was. Now we are always saying is, oh, V pi of S is basically when you kind of uh, fix clamp that second argument to be what pi itself is saying. Okay, and if pi is stochastic, it will be an average like this. If pi is not stochastic, let's say pi is not stochastic, it's in, in fact even more simpler case. Then okay, let me do it here. V pi of S would be equal to Q pi of S comma pi of S. Okay, if, if pi is not suggested. This is this is the relation between V and uh, uh, state, you know, state value function and the state action value function. Okay. 
similarly let's now what we want to say is how is q pi of s comma a is related to uh, v pi of s s so 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 for that let's again look at a diagram now the diagram has at the top uh, a node corresponding to s comma a let's say for the current s comma a so we are at a state s we already decided we want to take action a for that because of these decisions of these inputs you know the second input let's say the action little a is what we want to take what is the state action value of that pair right so that state of action um, uh, value for that pair is related to the value functions at some subs, you know succeeding states that i'm get, i'm going to get to what are those succeeding states because of the state as an it can action a we know because of transition probability function uh, script p or whatever p that will end up in state s prime and let's say there are only two values you know s1 and s2 that i can get to those are the two potential states i can get to okay and for each of each of the states there is going to be a corresponding uh, value right uh, so v pi of uh, uh, there's going to be a corresponding value v pi of that whatever that 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 state is okay uh, it doesn't have to be two for example this could be another state um uh, sorry another state s3 for example and so on okay so q pi of s comma a is because i had the you know the second argument you know a doesn't have to be related to what pi is suggesting so for that i'll get an immediate expected reward which is r of s comma a so r of s and a plus a discounting you know this is the optional but let's keep the discounting plus discounting and this is the probability with this is an expectation this is the expectation of the v pi of the next state uh, let's say st plus 1 okay so that expectation is expanded out here it's just the sum of the probability with which i'll get to little s prime probability which s prime is equal to so probability with which i'll get to s1 probability with which i'll get to s2 probability with which i'll get to s3 and whichever state i get to what's the v pi of that that specific state okay an expectation of that so that's how q pi of s comma a is related to v pi of you know uh, states and v pi of s is related to uh, q pi of s comma a in this way okay and this diagram is just relating you know a dark node just means uh, it's talking about a state comma action pair a specific state comma action pair uh, 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 this white node is just saying that it's it's a, it's a specific state okay so why do we need this uh, it's it's easier to uh, use this diagram and the recursive equations to motivate our um uh, q-learning algorithm um so let me come back to slide 52 i'm going to quickly scroll up yeah so what i'm going to do is uh uh first discuss the algorithm itself so that you know people now can at least see how historical data is being used to estimate something or learn something and therefore make better better decisions and then we're going to reason about okay why does ql ql learning algorithm even do whatever it's learning in a certain way okay it's not going to be it's not going to look like supervised learning and that's why we want to kind of intuit it a little bit more okay so um so so let's talk about finding the best policy okay this is what we want to do we care about finding the, the best as in you know really good policies you know it doesn't have to be this the single best but whatever so we want improvement right um so for that uh, in this literature people use two two specific words one is called prediction and another is called control so prediction is not the same as what we talk about in supervised learning it's basically prediction here just means estimation okay uh in the sense that if i have a policy can you tell me what q pi of s comma a is so if uh so given a policy tell me values okay tell me value of the policy okay so that's what i want to know so that's an estimation problem right so if if i have a policy and you're asking me what's the value of this policy i have to, i have to tell you oh at this state comma action pair this is the value at this some other state state comma action pair this is the value or if i'm telling you just a va state value function then i have to tell at every state what's the value of that state under this policy okay that's the that's an estimation problem if i have to learn you know if i have to tell you this based on data that i collect okay uh and the control problem is actually the optimization problem which means uh, how do i make improvements on pi okay and you will see that it's a the algorithm at least we are going to look at q learning has a very simple idea for uh, making an improvement uh, and and we we'll look at uh, how does it make predictions okay that's going to be the meat uh, of the algorithm 
Uh, but basically, the algorithm actually does both these steps uh, somehow simultaneously. So something, you know, these two steps are not separate. Okay. Uh, but why am I talking about these two steps separately? Is because it gives you, you know, it lets you think about many other algorithms that you may see in the future. You know, if if you go into this area, they can be, uh, you know, thought about as doing these two components, able to estimate for any given policy how good is that policy and uh, may, you know, are able to improve uh, the current policy, okay? And that's kind of expected, right? So you, if, you, if you are, let's say you start with some arbitrary policy, a random policy, let's say, of, you know, let's say controlling the joystick, you'll have to be able to say, oh, how good is this random policy? And then maybe, you know, improve on that, right? So, um, so that's the idea here. So let's talk about uh, Q-learning. So let's get into the algorithm and then we'll design with it, uh, you know, one of the uh, key steps in there. So what is the algorithm? So let's say uh, the algorithm is as follows. Let's assume a finite state. Finite action situation or environment, which means that the environment only can have like 10 states, let's say. And you can only take uh, three actions, okay? Buy, hold, and sell, for example. So, uh, so if you have finite number of states and finite number of actions, you can actually think of uh, the Q function we are talking about as a matrix, right? Because you can just say, oh, for every state, every state from let's say S1 to all the way to S10, and for those three actions, A1, A2, A3, each cell can tell me what's the value of being in that state and taking some action, right? I can store it that way. Although it will, will kind of, of course, uh, uh, do something more as we talk about deep learning and so on later. But this is one way to uh, store the state action value function, right? Any two dimensional function, you can think of it as a matrix as long as its inputs are finite, okay? So we'll initialize a table. Uh, a table is basically this, this matrix. And let's start with some state, okay? So let's say maybe it's a fixed starting state uh, that will always start from there. So let's start with that. And then now here's the online ML uh, for loop uh, that somebody asked earlier. So for every time period, uh, what we're gonna do is uh, we will have to, so this comes back to online machine learning as well. We'll have to do something uh, which we have discussed before, which is explore and exploit. So if some of you we can go back to what we're talking about when we were discussing uh, epsilon greedy algorithm, right? So for machine, uh, multi unbalanced setting. So we'll have to do some exploration and exploitation. So for every round, what we're gonna do is We'll be given, what are we given? We're gonna be given ST, which is the current state of the uh, environment. So given that, uh, we'll take an action uniformly at random, which means that we're gonna we are gonna be exploring with some probability, okay? So uniformly at random just means every action is, you know, with the same probability. I'm gonna, if, if there are three actions, then I'm gonna try each one with uh, probability, you know, 0.334 or whatever, okay? Um, but uh, with some slightly different probability, uh, which is, you know, let's say this is epsilon is 10%, then with 90% probability, I'll take an action, which is the argmax of the current table, uh, you know, argmax of, you know, let's say I'm in, in that state, right? We had that table. So maybe I was in uh, state ST, which happened to be here. Then I'm gonna look at the three numbers, A1, A2, A3, and take that action, which has the highest number, okay? Using the current uh, Q matrix or the current uh, Q function that I've estimated. Okay, so that's how I would take an action. Uh, and ST is the current context that the environment is saying, is, is showing me, or uh, that's what I've measured. And, and, and then, so taking action is fine, but I have to somehow incorporate feedback. And what did I get once I took that action? I got the uh, next state and I got the reward. Okay, those are the two uh, numbers you can, so those are the two things that I got back, the next state observation that I can make an observation, and then uh, the reward, immediate reward, you know, in, in some situations I might have not, have not gotten a reward, so in which case R will be zero, that R. But uh, anyway, so I got two numbers back, right? So using those two, not two numbers, sorry, uh, the reward and the state uh, vector, for example, those two, uh, using those two and my, you know, what did I do? Like uh, in a given state, ST, I took an action AT, I got the next, uh, I went to next state and I got a reward uh, RT plus one, right? So given those four quantities, I'm gonna make an update. I'm gonna make an update to uh, the entry where 
which corresponds to the current state in which I took a specific action. Okay, so I'm only going to make an update at uh, the current state at uh, which I took a specific action, the AT that action that I chose. Okay, the update uh, is going to look uh, like this. So it's going to have, so it's going to be whatever is the previous value plus some, let's say, uh, I think I use this name here. Uh, yeah, some, it's called learning rate. But, you know, it's somewhat similar to the same learning rate that you see with, you know, uh, when you do a gradient update, for example, right? Uh, when you do a uh, gradient update, you had the previous value plus some alpha times uh, gradient is going to be the new value, right? And you do gradient descent. So think of it's something similar. So you can interpret it that way. And plus, uh, so basically the previous value plus learning rate times is essentially something like, like a, uh, I mean, it's not like, I would say at this point, it's going to be like a, Analogous. Oops. It's to uh, uh, gradient, but it's not really gradient, okay? Because the whole thing is a scalar equation here. So this is going to be some sort of like an error, okay? Um, and and we're going to disambiguate how they get this 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 particular error soon. So let me actually go down. So the update is this. So once you get the new data, which is uh, new, you know, the immediate reward uh, and the next state, you can actually update the current queue, you know, one cell in that queue in that function, uh, in that uh, table that we are maintaining using this this update. Okay, and this uh, this this part is called a temporal difference error. Okay, so it's called temporal difference because it's the difference between uh, your current you know, your current uh, estimate. So, so your current uh, Q value uh, at that state and that action. And what should be uh, like a one step. Uh, so what should be a new uh, value? You know, what should be a new value at that state and action? So what should be the new value? It should be the immediate reward plus, uh, uh, I mean, it happens to be in this case, immediate reward plus uh, some additional term here. At, you know, evaluated to the next state, uh, but in essence, this is this called temporal difference. I, I'm gonna explain a little bit more later of why this is the expression here. But this is some sort of a gap between what is what you thought as the state action value and what uh, a, a new state action value candidate should be. Okay, and uh, epsilon is the exploration parameter, very similar to epsilon greedy, and as I said, alpha is the uh, learning rate. Okay. So this is it. This is the algorithm. So, so you can see that the algorithm is literally not really thinking about policies, right? So it's not really thinking about explicitly maintaining a pi object. It's basically maintaining the Q object, which is basically for us, you can think of it as a, as a table or as a matrix. And the matrix is being updated every time we take an action, we get this additional new, you know, immediate reward and a next state. So uh, the moment we're getting those two extra, uh, you know, those two responses from the environment, we are updating the an entry in the in the table, okay, and and there are a couple of parameters: exploration, learning, and you can actually, uh, I mean, so theoreticians have shown that under appropriate conditions. Uh, okay, let me finish this sentence. Uh, so under appropriate conditions, you can actually show that this table is going to be equal to the optimal table that you can have. Okay, optimal table is the table uh, where. Uh, uh, you know, where basically it's the best Q value, uh, sorry, state action value uh, you can obtain for every pair of state actions. Uh, so every state action pair, okay? Uh, by the way, this left-hand side here is essentially some sort of a random variable because clearly uh, uh, clearly the next state and, and this whole thing is a, like for example, this whole for loop is a particular realization of all these random variables, right? So. Q object, at least in, uh, you know, in terms of theory, is going to be a function of all these random variables. And so this uh, there's some nuance in terms of writing this limit, uh, you know, that the, this Q being updated, the Q table being updated over and over again, eventual Q table is still a random variable. It's just that that random variable uh, is equal to the true, uh, is, is equal to the best Q table, uh, you know, uh, uh, in some, some, some probabilistic sense. And I'm not going to detail that. Here and actually, this was proved about 28 years ago, right? Uh, so it's quite quite uh, an old algorithm. 
Now let me come back to this question, which is where will the updated Q value incorporated in the Q table? So it's exactly the same place, right? So wherever S, T and A, T was read, you're gonna update that location with a new number. Okay, it's like a update at one cell of your uh, table. And, uh, and Professor, uh, uh, the second point, uh, take yeah. argmax with probability one minus epsilon. So you're picking the instances that is ST or ST plus one with the probability uh, one minus epsilon. Is it that way? Uh, no, so re recall the uh, online machine learning for loop for T is equal to one to T or whatever infinity. Uh, you get a, you environment gives you ST. So you get ST, you play AT, and you get RT plus one and ST plus one. And you can, so this, yeah, this ST plus one, this will repeat because this is the same thing as here, okay? In the next loop, for example. Yeah, right. Uh, so you got these four, uh, and, and you're just updating Q of uh, ST and AT based on these four things. Uh, so your argmax, so you, so at any given point of time, you have this table, so you can always find, so, so as because ST is given, you just focus on one row of the table. Let's say okay. if the rows are in display states, yeah. you just look at one row and take the maximum. Yeah. Uh, I mean, to say, uh, what, uh, what is the probability one minus epsilon attached to this? Oh, this is the randomization. I right? remember in epsilon greedy with epsilon probability, you'll take a random, random action or with uh, one minus epsilon probability, you'll take the best action that you can do so far. Right. Okay. So oh. uh, with one minus epsilon probability, you take the best action. Hmm. Or with epsilon probability, you take a random action. Okay. 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 Got Sorry, it. I should. Uh, I think I should say take at is equal to arc max of that. Maybe I should say that explicitly okay. here. So this okay. is actually equal to at. So it's not in a sequence, as in we first choose it randomly. I mean, it's either ways. Oh yeah, yeah. It's uh, yeah. sorry. I think I should write it different way. It's basically okay. for. Uh, so you just. So I guess the two steps are flip a. Uh, coin okay. with this okay. bias epsilon if it lands heads uh, do you know pick a random action if okay. it lands tails uh, pick uh, the best action so far okay okay got it yeah, yeah. okay so that's the uh, q learning so the algorithm is simple and 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 uh, if you do this so, so you know you're learning right so you are going on and on and over and over again and maybe sometimes the environment is ended right like uh, maybe you failed in the game then you restart, right? So you start again from another state, keep going on again and again and again. So this can be repeated, okay? The, you just maintain, keep updating the Q table over each interaction that you have, okay? And and that and that's uh, all of this algorithm is only maintaining the Q values. Uh, at any given point of time, you can tell what the policy is. At any given point of time, the policy is gonna be, I mean, let's say you terminate this uh, Q learning process. Okay, so then eventually you have some Q table. Let's say you terminated at some uh, some time period t, right? So there's a table. You ha you have a table, right? Uh, because you terminated at this point, and if somebody asks you what's the policy uh, that you know you learned, then the policy is for every state is going to be just the argmax. I mean, at this point you don't need exploration because let's say you learned, uh, you know, while learning you needed exploration. It's just the argmax over a of uh, Q of s comma a. So just for every row, what, which entry is the highest is the action that you wanna suggest as my policy, okay? So that's the uh, policy. And so of course, as Q tables are changing, of course the policies are changing, but we're not explicitly talking about it in the learning algorithm. Uh, and the algorithm actually works in the sense that in terms of theory, uh, it's, a, it's basically people, have, you know, folks have shown that um, if you have a finite state, final action, uh, MDP, uh, Markov addition process, and if you do this repetitive procedure, as long as some additional, you know, uh, I guess assumptions are true, which are not, you know, too overbearing, then you will uh, kind of learn that the best uh, policy. Okay, so because you know Q will converge to Q star, and therefore pi will be essentially equal to uh, pi star, which is the best policy, which maximizes the expected cumulative reward. Okay, in your environment. So, so that's the nice thing about Q learning. And, and uh, one of the questions in the assignment is about deep, deep Q learning. Uh, we'll get to that uh, next time, but uh, it's basically built on this, this idea, okay? And so what we have not spent uh, our time on, and we'll try to understand that, is this, uh, why this update? Okay, so we'll focus a little bit more time, uh, you know, uh, today to understand why, you know, why this update. And the, and the teaser is that this update is related to some approximations to the 
uh, recursion equations that we saw earlier. Uh, the Bellman, in particular, we're going to look at the Bellman uh, optimality equation that we saw earlier. Okay, and some approximations of that will get, give us this. I mean, some I guess uh, changes to that in a couple of steps will give us this. Okay. Um, any questions at this point? So in the Bellman equation, uh, we have this factor P S S. It's a, is it the transition probability matrix? Yes, exactly, exactly. And we don't have so, that, okay? Yeah. And we don't oh, have that. Okay. Because in our that's what I said, we were gonna approximate things. Okay, yeah. okay, yeah. Yeah, so I guess uh, for the rest of the folks, uh, the question was, there is this in, uh, in Bellman optimality equation. Uh, okay, let's call it B O E. Uh, there is the expression for, uh, I think, uh, yeah, Q star of S comma A is related to the immediate reward R of uh, S A T plus there is going to be an actual gamma times some summation of P of S prime or S S prime A, okay, uh, times uh, I think uh, I think there's a max or A prime. Q of uh, sorry, Q star of S prime and A prime, something like this. Okay, I, I think this is probably correct. Uh, but we'll we'll anyway see that in the slide. So it, it had an expression like this. Okay, this is a Bellman optimal equation, and there is this extra term here which we don't have. Okay, when we if you if you already had this term, then it would be a planning problem. Okay, where you're just solving and you know, you're not really learning anything. Uh, you already know everything about the environment, and you're just learning. Uh, so you're just solving for the best policy. Okay, so there are many methods to do so, okay, in in the in the literature for just planning or just searching. Uh, but of course, planning and searching will become hard when even if you know everything about the environment, just like you know, from the case of chess or go, you know everything, right? So uh, if you know the board state and you know exactly what move you're going to make, you know the next board state, for example, right? Uh, but uh, even in when uh, even when things are known, sometimes it's hard to solve for or optimize for the best policy, and then you'll have to bring in additional uh, uh, techniques okay and one of the techniques that we'll see uh, next class is uh, called monte carlo tree search okay it's a, it's a technique that's used uh, for doing uh, search very similar to uh, someone you know uh, suggested earlier like something like breadth first search and depth first search and so on this is also a search procedure uh, which makes sense for when you don't when you know the environment but it's too complicated to do that whole branching and, and do a search for what's the best thing to do okay uh, anyway, that's just a teaser. So let's come back. Uh, so uh, so let's uh, talk about some notation here. Uh, so BOE, a Bellman optimality equation, gives rise to this. Uh, gives rise to uh, an algorithm. So actually, some you know one or there's a, okay. So Bellman optimality equation gives rise to an algorithm called the Q-value iteration algorithm. So uh, Q value iteration is just, you know, Q values are just state action value functions. And there's an iterative algorithm to learn those if I know, uh, know uh, P S S prime A. Okay. If I know the transition probability function, then this Q value iteration algorithm uh, is an algorithm that you can very easily, I guess, intuit from uh, Bellman optimal equation, or not very easily, but like it follows from the Bellman optimal equation, optimal equation in a in a, in, in a straightforward way, if I know the if I know this, with which I can estimate the optimal key values. Okay, but um, what we're going to do is do a lot of changes. First is we need to uh, um, uh, we, we're going to do something incremental. Okay, so remember in Q in the Q le Q learning algorithm, if I'm in a state S and I take an action A, only that cell is being updated. Right in the whole table in the whole uh, matrix, you know the state at which I am. And this action that I took, that cell, because I got a new state and a new reward, I'm going to update that. So that's that's a very incremental update. I'm not updating the whole table, okay? Where uh, that's one thing that that's going to be different. There's also going to be some sampling involved because I don't have uh, the full uh, uh, full. Uh, so I don't have this object here. Basically, I don't have the transition probability function. And of course, I as you saw in the key learning algorithm, we also added some exploration. There's a very simple strategy, epsilon greedy, but still we added some exploration. That is not something you would do when you're just doing planning or when you're just doing optimization because you you already know uh, the dynamics of the environment, so there's no need to explore, okay, to learn anything. So Q value iteration 
uh, it's represented uh, uh, using this equation on the left side and Q learning is equation represented using the equation on the right side. Okay, both equations look very similar to each other. And so what's the similarity? You can see, I mean, uh, uh, there is no expectation operation uh, on the right side. And this this arrow, so this arrow with a with a uh, superscript alpha represents this. Okay, so left hand side x basically is updated with x plus alpha times y minus x. Okay, so it's just a short form for that. Otherwise, we could have written q is equal to q plus uh, right hand side minus uh, q the whole times alpha. Okay, so q learning update is essentially this. So just to recap. Q of s comma a was equal to the old value, right? Q of s comma a plus some learning rate times the TD error, which was that uh, the immediate reward that I got plus uh, max over, uh, I think a prime, let's say, a prime of a Q of s prime uh, a prime, okay, minus Q of s comma a. Okay, why did we write it this way, right? So uh, you see, uh, first of all, this whole thing can be just written as one minus alpha times uh, Q of S comma A plus, or oh, sorry, this should be A, not A, uh, plus alpha times some new number, which is R plus max over A prime of a Q of S prime comma A prime, okay? I mean, uh, this equation is the same as uh, this equation, right? I mean, I just uh, took the common term here, this, this guy. So you can see that the new update, let's call it new here. Uh, this, let's call this old. It's basically saying the new value, new state action value is nothing but uh, some sort of a average of the old value plus some new in information that I got. Okay, that new information that I got is, is this. Okay, because I got a, a, an immediate reward and I also know which state I meant. So anyway, coming back here, uh, the Q value iteration uh, expression, if you just look at it, right? This expression is actually just the same as Bellman optimality equation if I had put equality here. Okay. Remember Bellman optimality equation is saying Q of S comma A, or Q star actually, is equal to immediate reward plus gamma times max of Q star. Let's say I put Q stars here. Uh, gamma times max of Q star. That's it. So the expectation is actually that uh, that T object that we were talking about. Okay, uh, you would need that. So that's Q. Q. This is Bellman optimality equation, and that can be changed to get this what is called Q value iteration, which is an algorithm when everything is known. Okay, but you know we we we, we care about learning. So in Q learning, basically we are trying to get you know somehow move from the Bellman optimality equation by making a few changes, making something incremental, like only updating one entry in that Q table, for example, doing something in a, without taking expectations, and then also introducing a sun gradient to the mix. Okay, once we do two, two, three, two, these three things, then you essentially get the Q learning update, okay? Uh, so let's spend a minute on Q value iteration, just to get a sense of like what, uh, what are the, uh, you know, because Q value iteration is also trying to get the best policy when everything is known, by trying to exploit the Bellman optimality equation. So, how do you, so when we say so how do we how do we do that? So, because the idea is that if you can go from Bellman optimality equation and understand how Q value iteration works, then you will able able to reason why Q learning looks like that. Okay, Q learning is doing a certain update the way it is doing. Okay, and that's kind of critical because of course uh, you can use. Uh, uh, the many many algorithms, but Q learning is uh, Q learning based algorithms uh, are are quite popular and, and easy to uh, code up as well and, and things like that. So it's it's good to know this this sequence. Okay, from Bellman optimality equation, what does Q value iteration look like? Uh, which is a way to learn good Q values when everything is known. To the situation which is Q learning where uh, you don't you basically get one response. You know, so you kind of ping the uh, environment with a you know you you show an action the environment comes back with saying oh here's the next state and here's the next one okay uh, so so how do we get to Q value iteration you basically turn the Bellman optimality equation into an iterative iterative update so uh, recall what's the Bellman optimality equation is just Q star is related to Q stars at uh, later stages so again uh, this notation uh, this dark uh, circle represents a state action pair 
you are you know because your state action pair you took a certain action you got an immediate reward and you went to some new states okay uh, so new states could be you know there are only two new states here let's say s1 and s2 at each of the new states you can you know you can take some action so you, you can take maybe two actions a1 a2 maybe here also a1 and a2 okay and and so here uh, let's so this dot represents s2 comma a1 this dot represents s2 comma a2 because you know we are from s2 and we took action a1 we took action a2 similarly here this dot represents um, s1 a1 and this dot represents s1 a2 okay so the bellman optimality equation is relating q at a particular state action pair to q q values at uh, some future or some other state action value pairs okay so in this in this uh, diagram there are four and this extra notation here uh, the, the arc here just just means that you are taking a max operation okay which is what was there in the bellman optimality equation remember there's a max operation max over a prime so all it's saying is that the q value at a current state action pair is equal to the some immediate reward plus uh, some discount times uh, the expectation over the max over a at the subsequent at the new state that you went to okay so which is s prime which could be s1 or s2 okay so so that's a figurative expression for the bellman optimality equation now uh, instead of showing the uh, 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 the state action value function i want to illustrate something with the just the state value function okay so uh, uh, just to give you so what we what we going to do now is yeah so uh what i'm going to do now is uh try to make uh, the you know try to introduce why you know so what is the algorithm so this is still bellman optimality equation so the algorithm is going to be very simple okay you start with some q value so let's call it q not at it so it's going to be an iterative algorithm you start with some q not some some arbitrary table okay some fill in some random numbers okay you start with some arbitrary table compute the left hand side okay so compute the left hand side because you have the table you can take the max you know gamma is given uh, uh r is given in the sense that for every state action pair you know what r r is because remember this is everything is known okay and you can take an expectation right uh for any given state action pair you can compute the right, right hand side and that will give you spit out a new number right so you started with q not let's say and you computed the right hand side you get one number for a given state action pair that number now you plug it in into a new table for that s comma a similarly for a different s comma a you compute the right hand side you get a new number you plug it in uh, on the uh, onto the onto the left hand side so which you get you get a new table q1 okay and so you just now use q1 to compute the right right, right hand side to get q2 and uh, and then keep iterating it over and over again that's called q value iteration and uh, thanks to some mathematical properties this iterative procedure you know we had this uh, equality you know we had this bellman optimality equation right but we somehow con converted it to an iterative update equation where you start with some random numbers you keep uh computing the right hand side uh which essentially gives you a new q matrix again and again in every iteration that q matrix eventually will give you the best uh q matrix okay or basically the best q value function uh so that's uh so that's the idea behind this algorithm when everything is known okay and you can see that uh uh although this this diagram is ill suited here but uh you can see that in each update right in each uh, so when when i'm trying to get the new value for q of s comma a i have to take an expectation which means that if i'm at state st uh uh you know or s s comma a i, I have to take uh, an average of all the paths that i can go to till i reach to the next state okay i guess uh so what i'm showing here is just for the uh, value function and not the state action value function but let me draw it for the state of state action value function all i'm saying is uh, you have the dark dot at s comma a let's say i'm at s comma a i have to take um an expectation of all the uh, let's say s1 and s2 which is new states i get to and from s1 and s2 
the the actions that I can take, let's say A1 and A1 and A2, A1 and A2, okay? And uh, so if I have the Q values here, then I can get to, uh, you know, then I can get the Q values there, right? That's what's the Bellman, Bellman, uh, uh, expected, Bellman optimal equation. So basically all I'm saying is you have to average across these four numbers, for example, if there are two, two new, two, two possible future states and two possible actions at each of these two possible future states. Uh, but instead of that, what if you could just pick one path, okay? And that's the idea of sampling. So if, if you, you know, because you had four numbers, you have to take an expectation, right? So uh, for that, you needed this object P S S prime A, okay? We're gonna get rid of this object by saying, okay, let's just pick one path, okay? And, 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 uh, uh, update the update the right hand side okay and that's the idea behind sampling okay so which is basically i mean although this diagram is showing it only for the value function not the state action value function you can see that from a state instead of averaging across all possible future states i'm only going to have you know take the value at one future state okay so that's the idea uh, of of you know trying to circumvent that we don't know the the transition transition probability model, uh, transition probability function, okay? So that's uh, one trick, okay? So what we have discussed so far is uh, get rid of this uh, equality. So try to go, you know, try to make an iterative procedure where uh, we evaluate the left hand, right hand side and get a new Q value on the, uh, new Q values on the, left hand, uh, on the left hand side and keep iterating this. On top of that, we'll get rid of this uh, expectation by just sampling one route, right? So some route like this, let's say it just happened that you have this state and then this action, okay? Um, sorry. Um, yeah, so one route where you, you pick only one state and, and uh, the action there is determined by the max operation anyway, okay? This, this max operation. So those are the two substitutions we'll make. So I guess this substitution and this substitution uh, and you can already see that uh, this changes already give us uh, essentially the Q learning update. So, uh, so if I do those two changes, then you can see that Q at S comma A, sorry, I'm not using Q star, but let's say at any given point Q of Q new, let me call it new uh, at Q of S comma A is equal to, you can see is, uh, I mean, uh, I don't want to do equality. So is equal to, let's say Q old S comma A. So, this update process, because I'm dropping this equality and, and changing this uh, sampling, I'm also uh, gonna do a weighted update, okay? So keep, keep Q old with some uh, multiplied with one minus alpha and plus alpha, I'm gonna do uh, the, the term that is supposed to be updated, this term, which is R of S comma A, R of S A, plus because I sampled, I get to some uh, new state and I just take the max over A prime at that new state, Q of uh, S prime and A prime, okay? Now this is exactly the uh, Q uh, learning update, okay? This is, uh, this is exactly, this is um, nothing but Q old S comma A plus the learning rate times the TD error, okay? That, that we saw a few slides ago, uh, this is exactly the same, okay? So that's the, uh, uh, I guess next slide was covering about the sampling. So instead of doing the, uh, uh, instead of doing the, uh, taking the expectation, uh, we take a sample. Okay, we take one one uh, sample path, okay? Which is which just means one realization, S prime. And that S prime is actually given to us because uh, when we interact with the environment, when we play an action AT, we do get the new action ST plus one, just, just sorry, new state ST plus one, which you can just use that as a sample of the future state, okay? Uh, let's actually drop this, this diagram is a little bit incorrect. So let's drop that. Uh, so we did the sampling and incremental iterative update. Incremental update because remember if uh, this, this update is only happening for a given state and action, okay? So given state and action, it's, this update is not happening for all states and actions. In Q iteration, uh, Q value iteration, this update would happen for all states and actions simultaneously. So as if like there's a full old table and we get a full new table uh, in one iteration. Here, uh, 
we are only going to update one cell of the table uh, in, in this way, okay, using a sample. Sorry, this way. This equation. And also, and the final thing is that we need uh, to ensure exploration and uh, somehow Q-learning bakes this into um, the uh, algorithm in the sense that this action here, A prime, is not the action that is played at all, right? So the action that is played is actually, uh, uh, you know, like for example, the action, this action that was chosen, A, was actually from the epsilon, was chosen in an epsilon greedy way, in the sense that, that A was chosen by saying, oh, I'm in state S, let me with some probability epsilon pick a random action, with some probability one minus epsilon pick an action which is the most promising currently, in, you know, for that, by just looking at the row of that Q table, right? Um, so that extra, uh, you know, so that means that the policy there is actually uh, an, uh, a randomization, randomized policy, right? Because the policy is not deterministically picking an action, it's saying with some probability I'll pick a random action. Okay, so so that's the action that we picked. Although there's a max over A prime, this action is irrelevant to us, okay? Whatever is the action that maximizes this value is not gonna be relevant. In the next loop, we are again gonna do this epsilon greedy uh, sampling, okay? This epsilon, epsilon greedy way of choosing an action. So in that sense, um, I mean, I'm not going to go into technical details. In that sense, uh, this this update is called off policy update. Let's not worry about it. All I'm saying is that this this action that actually maximized at the new state is not really used to uh, play at the new state. Okay. Um, uh, which is what I was mentioning. So actually, let's skip this slides. The action that we use uh, is basically this. So the update that I wrote on the side uh, earlier is essentially this. So the old QSA at the at the Q will be just updated with the previous value uh, plus some TD error. Okay, so it's basically a weighted average of uh, the new observations that we got uh, plus the old value. Okay, so this this underlined thing here is called the TD error. And, and the action that actually maximizes this at the new state is actually never played. Okay, this is a new state, which is that action is not played. In the next iteration, you play again by sampling from the greedy strategy. Oh, sorry, epsilon greedy strategy. So, uh, any questions? Let's let's go back to uh, oh wow, we are out of time. So let's go back to uh, the algorithm uh, and look at it. So basically, in every time step, uh, get st. You see a context. Take an action. Take an action. You, you know. Uh, take an action either greedily or with some uh, random action with some probability. That's these two steps. Uh, and then update a specific entry in your Q table. Okay, that's essentially what Q learning is. And we just discussed a little bit about intuition of why that equation makes sense. It just starts from Bellman optimality equation. And that's about it. So. Okay. So we actually did not get to the meat of uh, what we wanted to discuss today, but we'll discuss it next time. Uh, but so far, what have we seen? So basically, RL, we saw some examples, I guess, uh, uh, videos. So RL is a good example, good framework to work, to make agents in, intelligent over time, basically, uh, as, it, as they get feedback over time, rewards, basically, over time. Um, and you just have to specify what you need to do. For example, go from, let's say, for driving, it should be go from point A to point B and just provide feedback. Okay? And the feedback need not be in terms of like an error or the true class or anything. It can be just a positive reward or negative reward. There are many challenges. Uh, what we saw is, is just basically the basic, basics of RL. Uh, there are many, many directions that are still being pursued, uh, but it may be a promising direction for uh, AI uh, or auto autonomous agents in the future. Uh, in the next lecture, we're gonna look at, we're gonna, you know, next lecture is a segue for us to get back into deep learning. So next lecture will be a mix of RL plus deep learning and the subsequent lectures will be pretty much again, back to deep learning. So. Uh, next lecture, we'll see deep learning and how it can be used as something called function approximation. So where we'll get rid of this idea of a Q table and think of again back as a Q function and, and work with that function. Okay, And we'll again see how to learn uh, such Q functions. And we're going to also talk about planning again. So we're going we're gonna to look at the game of Go uh, instead of chess. And we'll again come back to... Uh, 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 we'll look at why planning itself can be difficult difficult, and even then you can use uh, uh, a deep learning to help you uh, deal with that search problem. Okay, So 
uh, that's it for today uh, thanks for listening uh one other one last question can yeah. i ask uh so uh this q table when you say initialize it could be uh, like a simple table like all zeros or all rows and columns and as we yeah. know we have yeah. zeros may not be good at, yeah you can certainly put zero so yeah think of it as uh like for a small state action space yeah you can just put random numbers there okay it means zeros are also fine i just have to double check that that's not going to uh mess up with your updates uh so that you actually move from here to and make and and, and change the q values okay so, okay as long as uh, i think it's fine as long as the rewards are non zero uh, okay. if you have a delayed reward where the rewards only happening at the end they will call it not make progress yeah okay and also uh, since we would like to you know improve the sample size and we want to fill in we want to update the whole table as much yeah. as possible yeah. so uh, is it is it possible like we initially try to e- exploit more as in like explore more samples rather than sticking on to the one which gives more rewards yeah that's a great idea so uh, you want to explore more so you can actually yeah. schedule the epsilon actually so initially mm-hmm. epsilon can be 80% of the time you explore all the way to you know and then later on several stages later you can do 10% or even okay. less okay and in fact in theory you are supposed to do this for uh, you to learn actually okay. so i i kind of didn't uh, spend too much time there so when i showed you that oh this 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 q learning uh, in an unknown rl environment will get you to uh, q star uh it requires uh some scheduling like this okay where you explore okay. more at the beginning but stop exploring eventually oh, so we have the sophistication to do that as in like in yeah, yeah i mean you can certainly choose it right so you can say oh first uh, 100 rounds to 80% yeah. with epsilon keep keep epsilon is 0.8 and next 100 rounds you keep it you know decrease it by you know 10% and so on you can do that okay yeah okay yeah thank you professor Okay, so let me actually start the recording now. Uh, Yeah, thanks everyone.